Good morning and a very warm welcome to all those who've joined us for MedCat's WISA 2023, which stands for Women in Intel Security, EHS and Resilience. Thank you to all those who've taken out the time to be with us. I'm Shreya Talwar, Senior Analyst with the Predictive Risk Intelligence Team at MedCat and will be your host this morning. We're just a few days away from the International Women's Day and this year the theme is Embrace Equity. An interesting theme as it uh, is different from equality that promotes equal opportunities and same resources, whereas equity recognizes that each person has different circumstances and allocate the exact resources and opportunities needed to reach an equal outcome. And we at MidCat are privileged and honored to take this forward through a wonderful set of conversations planned. And before I begin, I'll quickly walk you through the agenda for the day. We will begin with an opening keynote by Ms. Preeti Opala, followed by our first panel discussion on women in corporate intelligence leadership, which will be moderated by Ms. Aparna Godar. We will then have an unveiling of the women's security booklet, followed by a panel discussion, the second one of the day, on women in resilient sustainability travel technology leadership. This will be moderated by Mr. Malcolm Cooper. We then have another keynote address by Ms. Uh, Ingrid Topberg, uh, she is the Chief Digital Transformation Officer at Thrive DX uh, on women in technology and innovation, empowering ourselves to become innovative, forward thinking, future leaders and change agents. We will then end the discussion uh, with a panel, panel on women in security leadership, and this will be moderated by Ms. Kamini Guleria. So without further ado, we now begin with our opening keynote. And before I hand over, I would just like to quickly introduce um, uh, Preeti uh, here. Uh, she is a former investor, uh, investment banker turned thought leader and media entrepreneur based in Hollywood, California. Advisor to many private technology companies as well as a member of the Young Presidents Organization in various travel technology and innovation councils. She works as a geopolitical expert, award-winning international columnist, and is the director of the Omnia Institute. She hosts a popular news show called The Preeti Experience and is a much sought after radio and TV commentator on shows around the world. Along with being an author, she is a political analyst and her work is appearing in more than 100 publications, including The Observer, The National Telegraph, Business Standard, Foreign Policy, Times of Israel and Times of India. She has spoken at various think tanks, has been a keynote speaker at global summits such as WEF, Oasis, BRICS and the Center for Human Prosperity, among others. She has received the Young Leader of the Decade Award at the Women's Economic Forum, as well as the Icon of the Year at the Promising India Foundation. It, as certified Dharma Ambassador, she has given lectures on thousands of students and corporate clients on the topics of Sanatan Dharm, feminism, soft power, and Indian philosophy. No stranger to adventure, she has also visited over 100 countries and imbues her literary and journalistic work with international sensibilities. Her expertise is on foreign policy, US-India relation, South Asian politics, counterterrorism, conflict resolution, and international diplomacy. She speaks five languages, and her literary work has been translated into several languages. She holds a BTEC and a B marketing from Australia and certifications in nuclear terrorism from Stanford University and counterterrorism from Georgetown University. She's an accomplished executive with 15 years of experience building, advising, and investing in businesses in Australia and Asia and the United States. It is definitely a very big honor to have you today with us. And with this, I invite you, Preeti, to please address the audience that we have today. Namaste, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Good morning to everybody. It's indeed a privilege to be invited to deliver such a special keynote address at Wiser 2023 to the Women in Intelligence, Security, and EHS. So a few days back, I came across a statistic that women today make up about 10% of the CEO positions in among the Fortune 500 companies. There was a lot of celebration on, uh, in the media and on social media. And I was thinking, you know, I think the number needs to be a lot higher than 10% to have such a celebration. Women are natural leaders. They give life. They are the origin of man and they make up 50% of the global population. 
So it's only in the fitness of things that perhaps one day it's not impossible to reach 50% of representation of women in leadership positions across the board, whether it's politics, government, business, to companies, boards, and even in your industry, the Intel security and safety industries. So we are just a few days away from the International Women's Day. This year, the theme is Embrace Equality. This has been specified as per the International Women's Day website. But I think we need to support this theme on every day, not just on the International Women's Day. A, suggest, a study that has come out recently has suggested that during COVID, which undoubtedly is the biggest global crisis of our lifetime, that it was countries led by women leaders that systematically and significantly fared better. Whether this was New Zealand led by Jacinta Ardern, Germany led by the former chancellor Angela Merkel, Denmark with Mette Friedrichsen, Taiwan's Tsai Ing-wen, or Finland's Sanna Marin. All these women did definitely better than a lot of their alpha male counterparts leading large countries. The analysis of 194 countries published by the Center for Economic Policy Research and also the World Economic Forum suggests that this difference is real and it may be explained by the proactive and coordinated policy responses adopted by female leaders leading to fewer deaths. Now in our industry, defense, corporate security and safety have traditionally been the male preserve, brawn over brain, you might say, or might is always right. But with the rapid advances in technology, especially in the security and intelligence spaces, the playing field is more level than ever. And this need has evolved for a much more fresher, more innovative and more instinctive approach to security and crisis management. As with the COVID experience of crisis management has proven, women are well suited to provide crisis leadership and harness the power of AI and tech to redesign security protocols. My message to you is really, if you are a young girl or a young woman, no matter where in the world, don't ever think that you lack the skills required in this industry, because you don't. I really believe that you bring something very unique to the table and that everything that's required to do well, you have it in you. In fact, apart from intangible qualities such as empathy, compassion, and understanding, which are very unique and specific to women, you bring qualities such as adaptability, the ability to multitask, and very importantly, the ability to see the macro, to see the big picture. I think if COVID and even this current conflict that is going on, that has engulfed all of us globally, if there's one thing that these crises have taught us is that I think there is a need to think differently. There is a need for new kind of leadership in the world. I think we're looking for a new direction, a new path, um, a new way to do things, because I don't think how we've done it so far has gotten us really the results that we've desired. We already see a lot of women getting into corporate intelligence, but companies like Midcat are doing a fantastic job of incubating and nurturing talent. I am told that nearly 80% of Midcat's intelligence team is made up solely of women and 50% of their entire workforce, again, comprises of women. 
there are very few companies in the world can actually make that claim. So well done, Midcat. I am a global citizen. I travel around the world speaking and I find incredibly talented and brilliant young women all around the world. And there are so many stories of women, leaders, mothers, sisters, and daughters. And especially, I see this no more uh, prevalent than in India. Every time I, I go to India, I see women um, really doing so well in the STEM fields and in highly male dominated industries. So that's a great path forward, being one sixth of humanity, being the largest democracy in the world. I think those are great signs for the rest of the world to follow as well. In the developed world, more and more women have joined the workforce. Issue is almost 40% now. So there is a definite need for a more sensitive and different approach to security and safety. As the environmental health and safety concerns mount globally, I think women EHS leaders will do probably very well, if not better than some of their male counterparts even to manage and lead the function. Women security professionals come with a unique set of um, skills like adaptability for the evolution of a completely new paradigm of inclusive end-to-end -end IOT and a very AI-driven security architecture supplemented by none other than the human gut and the human instinct. Women will play an increasingly an increasing role in leading and redefining security roles and SOPs. I truly believe this is gonna be the case in the future. I commend the Indian army because I have heard that now they even accept women for combat roles and also they accept women in the National Defense Academy. Women have always done well being fighter pilots for the, for the Indian um, Air Force and they have always been a very important part of the NASA space missions. Women tend to do really well in these roles because they have good instincts, they are process driven, they follow and ensure adherence to rules and regulations, which is very important in a very high stakes environment. We compromise very less on SOPs. So we are thus well suited, I believe, um, for an industry that requires much discipline, process orientation and commitment. So I would really like to compliment uh, MidCat Advisory uh, on hosting this amazing event and the program that you've put together for everybody and really in its initiative to promote women in the workforce. I could go on and on, but I will stop here. There are many brilliant women waiting to come on after me, and I'm sure they will have many, many inspiring stories of their own to share with you and to inspire you. I am particularly very excited to also hear from um, your other keynote speaker, uh, Ms. Ingrid Toppelberg, and I look forward to this, some very exciting panels. Um, good wishes to the moderators of these panels, Aparna, uh, Mr. Malcolm, and Kamini, uh, who will be doing a great job moderating these panels, no doubt. And also, good luck and congratulations to the panelists themselves. But most of all, a big thank you to you. Yes, you, a very diverse and wonderful audience who have joined us this morning or evening uh, across 12 time zones. It is such a pleasure to speak with you. This is Preeti Upala signing off from Los Angeles, California. And I just wanna add, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the event. And from my part, special thank you to my dear friend from Horasis, Colonel Sam, and of course, General Sudhir Sharma for having me. Thank you again to Midcat Advisory. I hope you have a, a wonderful event. Thank you. Namaste.
Thank you so much, Preeti. That was absolutely fantastic. I am still trying to wrap my head around all the things that you do. And I think before we let you go, I would just, as a you know working person, just like to ask you, how do you manage your day? And of all the things that you've listed out, which um, of those things uh, is something that you really enjoyed doing? Well, thank you so much again for having me. Wonderful question. Well, as a woman, I have this unique skill to multitask and you can all do it. And to be fair, even the men can do it. It just takes a little practice. I think we're able to think about different things at the same time and uh, thus we're able to physically perform many duties at the same time. I like all my different roles uh, equally, but I think when I engage with audiences, when I speak to whether it's one person or thousands of people, um, whether it's in person or through Zoom, speaking to people, connecting with them, engaging with them and sharing uh, with them, I think that brings a lot of joy to me and I want to do much more of it this year and in the coming years. I think my real voice really is my voice and I have to use it more. So I look forward to doing much more of that in the near future. Thank you so much. And uh, again, once again, for making the time uh, for joining us and on behalf of Midcat, uh, for sparing and sharing your thoughts. Uh, I would like to request you to please stay on for as long as you can and attend the rest of the event. And uh, I hope you continue to inspire the rest of us like you do and wish you all the very best. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. So with that, we now come to our first panel discussion on women in corporate intelligence leadership that will be moderated by Ms. Aparna Goda. She is the Associate Director of the Predictive Risk Intelligence Team at Midcat Advisory. She comes with over 18 years of experience having worked in organizations such as the City Group, India Electronics and Semiconductor Association, and ISS Security Services. She has extensive experience that ranges from risk analysis for mortgages in the banking sector, research initi initiatives in the semiconductor industry, risk monitoring, and spearheading the security advisory for the corporate sector. Currently, she is the Associate Director of Predictive Risk Intelligence Services. And with that, I hand over to you, Aparna, to take it forward. Thank you so much, Rhea. Thank you so much for the introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, for whichever time zone that you're joining from. Uh, and thank you so much, Preeti. That was such an incredible keynote address and extremely inspiring and it just set the stage perfectly. Um, I would now request uh, my panelists uh, from panel one to just switch on their cameras uh, and turn on their microphones. All right, so it is an absolute pleasure for me uh, to moderate this panel. Uh, I have a power pack team here, so uh, <laughs> it's, it's going to be wonderful. And we have very diverse, uh, um, strong women um, discussing varied topics, and it's going to be an, an extremely interesting one. Uh, so first, I would be uh, introducing my panelists, and this is in no specific order. I would just request my panelists to raise their hand or say hi or, you know, so that the audience can connect with you as soon as I make the introduction and they can put a uh, face to the name. So um, I'll first be introducing Rebecca Drilling. Rebecca Drilling is the Assistant Regional Security Officer at the U.S. Consulate General in Mumbai, India, where she manages the security program comprehensively. She advises the primary law enforcement agency that advises the chief diplomat at post in all matters related to the security of personal property and information. Rebecca joined the Department of State as a special agent of the Diplomatic Security Services in 2014. She has conducted criminal investigations, protected the US Secretary of State, the US UN ambassador, and several foreign dignitaries during her first assignment in Washington, DC. She was assigned to the US Embassy in Baghdad, Iraq, and managed the local background investigations. Rebecca has also served the U.S. Embassy in Guatemala, where she oversaw the criminal investigations for U.S. visa passport fraud, as well as apprehending fugitives and returning them to face justice in the United States. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Moving on to Valentina. Valentina is a passionate security professional who started her career with intelligence corps of the Indian Army. 
She has been acquainted with corporate security for over 13 years now. Valentina currently handles physical security operations in the APAC region for CME Group. Her previous stints include Samsung r and Institute Bangalore and micro, Microsoft GTSE. At work, she focuses on keeping physical security solutions relevant to business aspects of remote management of site in this new normal and use of technology to aid perform manual security duties better. She has completed her master's in business administration and graduation in electronics and communications engineering. In her spare time, she enjoys playing badminton, baking, and crochet. Hi, Valentina. Hello, everyone. Hi. Happy to be here this morning. Thank you. Uh, hi, Kristen. Uh, Kristen is the APAC team lead for Amazon's corporate intelligence team and is based in Singapore. Prior to joining Amazon, Kristen worked at the State Department in Washington, D.C. for over 12 years. In her spare time, Kristen is an avid bookworm and loves to travel, practice yoga, and hang out with her fiancé and their feisty tabby cat, Kimchi. Hi. Hi, Kristen. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Thanks for having me as well. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, moving on to Divya. Divya Tyagi. Divya leads the Threat and Risk in Analysis Program of Asia Security Operations Center at Fidelity Investments. She is an experienced intelligence professional who assists business leaders in understanding geopolitical trends to effectively manage and mitigate associated risks. Hi, Divya. Hello, Pana. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, wonderful having you with us. Uh, now I would move on to my final panelist. Bipasha Bharadwaj. Bipasha is the founder of Intelligentsia Risk Advisors, a business intelligence and strategy consulting firm based out of Delhi. As part of the leadership role, she has assisted leaders, leading corporates and consulting firms in segment analysis, location and threat assessments, business intelligence and strategy impl implementation at the ground level. She has more than two decades of experience in the consulting world across sectors, including defense, pharmaceutical, fintech, power, infrastructure, and real estate. Apart from her professional endeavors, she is involved in various grassroots level philanthropic activities activities related to women empowerment and creating an ecosystem to promote talent across India. Hi, Bipasha. Hi, Aparna. So good to see you. Hello, everyone. Hi. Pleasure, pleasure having you with us. So in the panel one, we will be discussing women in corporate intelligence leadership. We will be talking about various challenges that we have faced recently and what we feel foresee for the future. We have an amazing panel here and I would request everybody to, uh, you know, share anecdotes from your rich and diverse experience because that's something that uh, the audience can really relate to and uh, it, it's something that would be very interesting to hear. A uh, request to all the participants, please feel free to, if you have any feedback or any comments, please use the chat box, interact with us. We will definitely read through it and we would like to uh, understand what you feel and what you expect from us. At the same time, in case you have any questions, please use the Q&A box for the, for the questions because if time permits, we will definitely try to answer all the questions for you, like if, if time permits, or we'll ensure that they're responded to. Uh, so with that, I will start the panel. And my first question would be to Rebecca. So Rebecca, we have witnessed the biggest disruptors of all times. We are talking about the COVID-19 here. And in your experience, do you witness a greater understanding of our work today? And what is your projection for the future? Um, from, from the perspective of how corporate uh, security and intelligence is going to be considered and looked at and how seriously are people going to take it? Yeah, over to you. Definitely. So in my, in my experience, obviously COVID was uh, something that we all had to manage. Um, and I think how my agency, uh, our motto views things is the most important way for us to move forward with security. Um, so the biggest thing for security, regardless of if you're doing, um, you know, cyber intelligence or if you're doing more physical security, is staying flexible. Uh, I work with Marines. Uh, we have Marine security guards at all of our embassies and consulates around the world, and their motto is Semper Fidelis, which means stay loyal. 
So diplomatic security, which is the bureau that I work for with the State Department, we like to say Semper Gumby, stay flexible, always stay flexible. And I think that is incredibly uh, important in our field of work, especially considering whatever dynamic situations that we may um, come up with, whatever we're addressing every single day. So whether that's you know, for me, access control, someone maybe did not put, uh, did not write their colleague's name or their contact's name correctly for someone coming into our facility. And so that causes a bit of a backup trying to get them in for whatever important meeting that they have and we have to manage that. Or let's say if there's a threat on our facility um, to our personnel, how do we manage that and ensuring that we're remaining flexible and we're not keeping everything in one specific tunnel uh, that we can think outside of the box. How do we manage these scenarios? Um, COVID was definitely uh, an overnight situation that we all had to manage, right? So immediately, uh, many of us had to go to a work from home model. Um, and in my case, or in my scenario, we had a hybrid situation where some of us would work from home half of the week and you'd have to come into the office the other half of the week and you wouldn't see your colleagues because we still had to manage whatever physical security aspect was due to essential personnel who still had to come into the office. Um, and not only just the physical, physical security, right, but our health as well. And on top of that, you know, not not just the physical security and remaining flexible for that, but you also need to remain resilient. And I think that's one of the biggest lessons that we learned during COVID. How do you ensure that you are continually able to manage whatever threat or risk comes up in our job? So taking care of yourself mentally, taking care of your families um, is incredibly important. And that's one of the things that I had to manage. I had a, a one-year-old at home and it was, aside from waking up every two hours at night, um, being able to be on, being able to manage my security uh, situation and portfolio virtually with my team, um, ensuring that we were meeting whatever metrics that we needed to for our job, and then also taking care of them and making sure that they were you know, mentally able and uh, taking the breaks and rest that they needed to still stay relevant and um, meet whatever our end goals were. And so I think when we look at our future uh, and what it holds in regards to the lessons that we learned from COVID, we need to remain flexible and we need to remain resilient. Um, if you are constantly getting burned out because you're not taking time for yourself, how are you able to manage um, your portfolio and keep your colleagues and your clients safe, right? And so, you know, COVID was very different and one of those random situations that we hope that we don't see again, but who knows, we're currently dealing with a crisis around the world that has affected every country and, you know, every sector of the world. Um, so remaining flexible in that, remaining flexible in whatever random thing pops up at work, which keeps things interesting, but also taking time for yourself, taking time for your family, uh, and making sure that you can still show up and do your job um, as well as we do every single day. And I think that's one of the best things that uh, we as women can do, and men as well, is that we remain flexible. Um, we can manage multiple things, but also just taking time for ourselves so that we can can still show up and not uh, not have anything else falter in the background because we're prioritizing one thing over the other. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you so much. That that was so relatable, and I, I think the most incredible thing is uh, uh, I think most women can relate to it is how holistic the thinking is, right? When we are talking about work, we are talking about a professional thing. You look at your uh, you know, colleagues as an extended family, you think about your family in the back end and everything that's happening, it's it's so holistic and it's it's uh, uh, it's so uh, natural to women and that's that's what came through. So uh, wonderful. And there are so many follow-up questions that I would have, but I think I will, uh, if we have time, we'll take it up later. Otherwise, you know, but, but thank you so much. Um, uh, my, my next question is to Valentina. Uh, so, Valentina, as an intelligence expert, how important is it to liaison with other departments within organizations for effective implementation of any of the decisions that have been taken? So, yeah, over to you, Valentina. Hi, Aparna. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I believe liaisoning is uh, very pertinent for every role, uh, no matter what. 
but a little more pertinent for uh, security professionals um, as it's important to ensure there is relevance uh, and how do you uh, get that licensing is a is a means which which helps us give a platform for information exchange for communication so communication uh, making it more relevant timely is what departments would prefer especially in this age where you know there's so much of information abundant information here and getting everybody drowned in that you know so there there is a need for somebody to bridge this between the information that is available be it the service provider or we are going and fishing out for it but you know how do you make it relevant and timely what is impacting the business is something which you know uh, as key uh, point of contacts you know you could bring in that value add to them uh, which probably will be a result uh, to get that extra flavor you know when you liaison with them when you constantly communicate you know what is the you know finer details that is, that would make it more relevant to the audience when you are trying to you know do a service delivery beat in some in terms of your security operations or with 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 the information that you share with them in terms of you know uh, uh, an advance uh, notice kind of a situation right so one size doesn't fit everyone there there needs to be a tailoring required uh, for the business for the uh, for the different departments that we are working with and i believe licensing is something which is uh, critical here which helps uh, you know do this task um, and constant consistent communication that you uh, you know garner over a period of time because of licensing helps build that trust you know ultimately that's what we try to achieve in security the business is always looking for a trusted advisor and uh, you know it's not that they expect to hear from a security manager i i don't think my my center head would ever want a call from me because the less he hears from me the happy he is that's my motto at work so uh, trying to be aware of that bit and uh, always foreseeing you know Uh, and not alarming the departments but more from a from from a perspective of giving them confidence is what i believe uh, information sharing is all about uh, because the general atmosphere is <laughs> a, a, a call from a security manager or uh, who was handling the security for an office is the last that they want to especially at an odd hour so in that sense i say that information sharing more relevant and precise and which is impactful to them so that you know what you should share and what you shouldn't because nobody wants their time to be taken away Uh, that's my take on this thank you thanks thanks uh, valentina just uh, like uh, just, just a follow up question now we are all working in uh, like hybrid mode right and every the all the organizations have taken different decisions a lot of organizations are completely work from home but more mostly it's hybrid uh, does that change the way you liaison with other departments does that communication channels change and are there any um, has it become more difficult i would always want to take it with a pinch of salt because when you try to you know uh bring out the aspect that we are we are virtual we are away we are not trying to see each other you know out of mind out of sight uh, there's always uh, that uh, confidence uh, factor which tends to go a little lower so uh, you have this technology which i would say is uh, has helped us there are many organizations which have gone and work from more overnight and even when they had to come back it wasn't a very hard decision for them to announce the hybrid model and as i said it is not just a decision that's already made uh, it is an ongoing process and you know all all of us you know beat every department is making its own tweaks to evolve as we grow in this in this new era so not trying to pitch out that is becoming disadvantages to us i would like to take it saying that uh what are the aspects that you could come up with what are the work arounds you want to work because each depart uh, each business is different and how you uh, you know as uh, rebecca also mentioned flexibility i would say flexibility is one that helps us evolve uh, the open mindedness to you know accommodate when requests come in be it last minute be it uh, a different requirement or something which we've never looked into these are some of the factors that i would say would uh, kind of help us uh rather than trying to say that uh you know um uh, we are not uh, communicating enough uh uh that's that's my two cents true true thank thank you thank thank you for those 
inputs. Uh, yeah. Uh, now I would move on to my next panelist, Kristen. Uh, hi, Kristen. So my question to you is, as an Intel analyst, do professional networks help? Do you interact with peers within your organization and across organizations and have discussions that, that, that are fruitful, that, that really help you with your work? Thanks, Aparna. Uh, absolutely. I think professional networks are a fantastic resource. My team at Amazon regularly holds benchmarking calls with analysts at other tech companies on a monthly basis. In fact, we, we just had one this morning. Um, so being able to bounce ideas and thoughts off my peers is really valuable, especially because we're mostly tracking the same geopolitical issues. Um, so sometimes talking to them provides kind of a sanity check, but other times I've found that my industry peers will often see an issue from a different angle or perspective that perhaps I hadn't considered, especially since different issues are going to impact different private sector organizations in different ways. So this is also a really useful exercise for benchmarking purposes. So I'll give you a specific example of a time that interacting with my peers from other organizations made a difference in my day-to-day -day job. So last August, when former US House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan, we all remember how there was escalated Chinese rhetoric and a reported increase in the military presence in the Taiwan Strait, right? Tensions were high, the media was all over this. So my team at Amazon was getting a lot of questions from our leadership in Seattle, understandably concerned and asking us about the possibility of the worst case scenario being a, a military conflict. So my team's assessment was that a full-blown military conflict was not imminent. Um, and so we were adding analytical context in order to try to manage the panic that was only unfortunately exacerbated by what was being portrayed in the media. Uh, but the important way that we were able to actually really help de-escalate the concern is by speaking with my peers at other like-minded companies. So during the course of these, these discussions and benchmarking, it became quickly apparent that none of the companies were actually changing their security postures due to the tensions in the, the Taiwan Strait. Uh, there was a lot of analytical discussions and report writing, of course, but in terms of the actual uh, company taking a, uh, a stance or changing their operating procedures or implementing mitigating measures, nobody was really doing that at that stage. So we relayed this benchmarking information to our leadership in the US and this provided much needed assurance from them. So it was really, really helpful to be able to, to talk to, to other folks um, at other organizations. So I can recommend a few professional networks and platforms for attendees on the call today. Some of you may not be familiar with these, these groups and some of you may, uh, but first I would recommend uh, joining OSAC for those who work for American organizations. OSAC is a US government run free service that provides fantastic networking opportunities with other industry peers. Uh, they also have a team of analysts based in the D.C. area in the U.S. Uh, that write reports and they can assist with security related inquiries. Um, so it's a really great free service. And the second professional networking group I would recommend is the Asia Pacific Analyst Roundtable or the APAR for short. This group is an excellent resource and it's comprised of intelligence analysts covering the APAC region. The APAR is led by a group of volunteers, as this group is also free. Uh, they put together periodic in-person and virtual conferences, and they also manage a telegram group where members can routinely share best practices, post questions, and uh, of course, benchmark with each other. And then the third resource I would recommend uh, for those on the call today is the Asia Crisis and Security Group, or the ACSG for short, lots of acronyms. Uh, this group is similar to the APAR, uh, except I think it's much bigger. This provides members in the APAC security industry with professional development opportunities, and they also share operational best practices and real-time tactical information. 
Um, and just for the awareness of, of everyone on the call, this is the group out of the three that does actually have a membership fee, but I found that it's well worth it um, in terms of just the wealth of knowledge and being able to, to chat with other like-minded security professionals. So I'll go ahead and stop there in the interest of time, but we'd be happy to answer questions at the end of the session. Uh, back to you, Aparna. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, and that, that was really useful. And I am sure a lot of, uh, you know, the people in the audience, our participants will fi find these tip tips very useful. Um, just, just wanted to understand, did you use these networks during the pandemic? And uh, we, we went through a phase, all of us went through this phase when uh, we were involved in taking decisions uh, post pandemic, like whether whether we think that the pandemic is done or we have to live with it, whether it's endemic, whether uh, we are going to continue with working from home or is it going to be hybrid? At that point of time, how helpful were, were these networks? Did you really take, um, uh, you know, opinion from uh, peers working in other organizations to probably come up with a plan and then discuss it internally. How, how useful was it at that point of time? Because that, that, that's a critical phase that all of us faced in recent times. Absolutely, that's a great point. And actually, yes, uh, we were very involved in, in discussions with other organizations. Um, so while my team, were, we weren't involved in any sort of decision-making, um, being the intelligence team, we were expected to help, you know, track the, the COVID situation and where that came, where that was used, um, the information was used to inform the return to office process. So it was really useful to be able to provide our internal stakeholders at Amazon with the benchmarking information that we garnered from other organizations. So, you know, saying like, well, this company decided to require testing in order to go to the office or this organization is requiring someone to be vaccinated to come back or you know all the, the different uh, procedures in place. They definitely varied. And I, I think that um, it definitely made our, our team look good because we were able to not just track case counts, <laughs> but also um, what other organizations are doing, which I think the leadership found very useful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen. Uh, now I will move on to uh, our next panelist, and that is Divya. Uh, so hi, Divya. Um, so uh, could you shed some light on organizations' resilience on reliance on intelligence inputs during crisis situation? I think this is in continuation with the discussion that we've had so far. And uh, when we are talking about reliance, uh, I would also want you to explain like what are the kind of inputs that you really look forward to and um, how is it helpful like in case um, you're 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 relying on any other external agency or any external provider what is it that you really look for and what are your benchmarks what are the internal benchmarks that you would say yeah so over to you thank you Parna. well mm -hmm. The past couple of years specifically have made it very apparent that intelligence inputs have become absolutely necessary for companies to strengthen their response and readiness for any contingencies, right? So, and this is true for all streams of intelligence, be it competitive, be it market, be it our main focus as of now, which is security intelligence. And for me, without effective intel on any event, it would be like walking on a road blindsided, blindfolded, right? Because we don't know what is happening. So what intelligence analyst does, largely does, and in con continuation, uh, the consultancy firm, as you said, does is scan through all the available inputs, cut through the noise, which we know in this current era, it's too, one too many sometimes in terms of news, in terms of fake news, everything else. Scan through that particular noise and compile relevant information for their businesses. Basically convert or filter through an array of information into an actionable threat intel. And this also replies to my, this also gives a reply to your latter part of the question or the question that is generally put in these industrial discussions or in the hallway discussions that, you know, what does intelligence analysts do? They we can watch the news everywhere. It's on BBC, it's on CNN. So why should we take note of this? And that is the exact reason that, well, you can look at 
all the news channels are giving out the geopolitical intel analysts information or inputs, but they're not telling you how it will impact your business. So one event that might be very geopolitically interesting might not actually have an impact. Whereas another event that might not even come into the main uh, international or national media might have a very huge impact on your business particularly. So, and just to put it in a context through my uh, career, there've been many incidences wherein uh, this has been hold true. So for example, um, one time a risk assessment report came into my table to write a risk assessment report about an event that was supposed to happen in the state of Rajasthan <clears throat> some couple of years back. And uh, there was a tentative date and venue, et cetera. And we were supposed to compile a risk assessment of that particular venue and uh, area. And during the research processes, we came to realize that one of the state entrance exam is also scheduled for those particular days. Now, people who are actual Intel, AMLED, the Intel analysts in this team would definitely get the kick. Oh, because there was a state Intel uh, exam entrance exam, there was a high likely chances of mobile internet specifically to be blocked in the particular regions for a particular slot of time. And that means business plausible business disruption for our businesses or for that particular event. Just that input helped the leadership or the concerned leadership of that particular event to push the date to a certain area, which is more low in threat in terms of any plausible disruption. And such kind of examples I have ample and many in my bucket. So for example, any inclement weather updates, wherein actual operational disruption happens in terms of transport disruption, in terms of cab delays or employees or critical employees being stuck in situation and leading them to not be able to effectively work. Leaders, there, I've been part of, throughout my career, I've been parts of calls wherein we are, we're sitting in the leadership table and based on our inputs, certain decisions are made. So, and it might lead from very tactical, the examples that I've given to very strategic. For example, when the, um, during the course of the Ukraine crisis and the corresponding everything else following behind, there were a lot of discussion about, okay, so energy crisis is happening in very actively in Europe or very evidently in Europe, but what does it mean for India? Should the businesses in India be preparing themselves for any plausible impact or whatsoever? So we have compiled reports, our team have compiled reports in order to understand, okay, so yes, this is what you see in the news about the energy crisis, but for India or for our businesses specifically, A, B, C, D, these are the plausible scenarios or these are the plausible impacts that can happen. So just summing up, and as I said in the beginning of my discussion, it has been evident that risk management capacity has become a very important factor, not just in the business continuity process, but also in the inception states. For example, I was reading this uh, report the other day by PwC advisory about how investors are calling on Japanese companies because of their uh, unique geological, geographical positioning to strengthen their disclosures on their response and readiness for contingencies such as the war in Ukraine, supply chain disruption caused by the pandemic and the increased tension between US and China over Taiwan. So all I can say is that in the current era where corporate neutrality or uh, corporate insulation to geopolitical events is becoming increasingly difficult, the need, to, the need of intelligence team to help navigate business is becoming important. And when I say intelligence team, there is of course an in internal team, but then as an extended arms, there are risk consultancy firms like yours and others in the market who have been who have become effectively essential for us to get our inputs because we cannot be the eyes of every location so everybody a lot of us highly rely on a consultancy firm to give us at least the first trigger of input and assist us in terms of understanding okay what are the benchmarks that other uh, sectors are also implementing Thank you. Thank you so much, Divya. And there are so many, again, I can have so many follow-up questions because you, you are someone who has transitioned and, you know, you have experience. You're one of those few people who has experience at consulting side as well as from the business side. Yeah. So you, you, you have, you can give us an overview of exactly what businesses need and what the thought process is, right? So uh, probably we can, yeah, if we have time, we can take <laughs> that up. But uh, right yeah. now I'll move on to the, yeah, uh, the next panelist. So uh, this is for you, Bipasha. Uh, what are your tips for aspiring Intel analysts? There are many who have joined today. Uh, what are the skill sets that they should hone and what are the tools that they should master? Yeah, over to I you, Bipasha. So Thank you so much, Aparna, for the lovely question. 
So this is something that I really wanted to address since I'm a founder right now and I'm looking to hire new talent. So what I'm going to say currently is a summing up or a summarization of what I've faced over the past four, five years since I've taken on this founder leadership role. So uh, one key thing that I've observed is that intelligence is a word that has been used very ubiquitously these days. You know, so every analyst, there's a consultant everywhere who's talking about providing intelligence. But in my past 20 years of experience, I have seen a paradigm shift in the way that intelligence is gathered and provided to the end user. So uh, in my opinion, intelligence gathering and assimilation has seen three growth phases in India. The first, which was prevalent, quite prevalent about 15, 20 years back, was when it was just about assimilating and scanning through various public domain sources and providing a consolidated report to the client. Next came a very uh, interesting phase wherein, you know, this first phase was getting combined with intelligence generation. And currently we are at a very interesting juncture wherein uh, there is a juxtaposition between AI tools, tech-based products and human intelligence. And this is where I think it's a challenge and an opportunity for the new Intel uh, professionals who are going to start in this world. Um, in my opinion, it's important that they remember three very important aspects. First is always identify the trigger and the precursor. Because if you don't identify the correct trigger right now, it might not be able to give you the correct preemptive intelligence in the future. You know? Second is always have a risk framework in mind or that will help you define your methodology. Like in a consulting firm like ours, we use the same intelligence, but it is spanned uh, to various segments of clients and the requirement of that intelligence and information caters to various uh, client locations, client uh, scope and so on. So it's very important to have a methodology in place. And lastly, always analyze and connect the dots because what you have seen today, what you have gathered today, uh, will be your experience for preemptive intelligence tomorrow. And preemptive intelligence is the phase that we are at currently. So what is the prognosis that you're giving your clients? Is it going to safeguard them in the future, in the short, mid to long term? So this is the stage that we are at and we are using technology tools plus human intelligence as well. So if you talk about the methodology, which is a very important aspect as well, it's always better to um, tap on your human network, liaise with the correct set of people, and also bolster them up with the correct technological tools to provide you the trends, patterns, and analysis. So my point to the bright new minds uh, who are all set to make a great impact is that never underestimate your power to identify and act on any credible information that can become intelligence tomorrow and use technology tools, bolster your analysis and theories, but never forget the boots on the ground. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank so you. much for the question. Thanks a lot. Uh, so now I will, we have a few minutes left. So I will be, um, uh, uh, you know, addressing each of the panelists and asking for your closing remarks. So uh, Rebecca, your closing remarks. Uh, this was absolutely wonderful listening to everyone's uh, experience and their input on all these questions. And I think that we did definitely have a theme going here. Um, flexibility, I think, is the key to ensuring that that we are able to be effective in our jobs, as well as ensuring that we take care of ourselves and reaching out toward networks as well to make sure that we can get the job done at the end of the day. And so I think that this is a really great step for all of us to network with each other. Um, I think I think Kristen and I actually knew each other in our former lives, uh, and. <laughs> And yeah, looking forward to uh, interacting with all of you moving forward and seeing what we can all do together. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And I think there's a question for you in the Q&A box. Oh. So if, yeah, if you can just take a look at it, it would be great. Uh, Valentina, um, your closing remarks. Yeah, firstly, thank you so much. Um, 
for uh, organizing this. Uh, happy uh, to see the initiative that uh, Midcat has uh, put in. It's not easy, uh, you know, trying to get uh, the time from so many people, the, sh uh, the schedule, and you know, trying to fit this. Uh, it was amazing and. Uh, Personally, uh, this was an awesome experience and uh, I find this session very useful um, uh, relating to the aspects of how and uh, bringing out the ideas of how women think uh, probably on the floor uh, is very nice and to see so much encouragement from colleagues in the industry. I, I, I just kept skimming through all the question answers and the, uh, you know, such uh, words of motivation and encouragement it feels so, so good. Uh, and uh, thank you once again. Thank you so much. Uh, Kristen, uh, any quote, any closing remark, anything you would want to say to uh, the audience? Sure, yeah, I'll leave you with a quote that I, that I really like. Uh, it says, your assumptions are your windows on the world. Scrub them off every once in a while or the light won't come in. This is a quote from the famous American writer, professor, and um, science fiction guru, Isaac Asimov. Uh, the reason I chose this quote is just to remind everyone, no matter how long you've been an analyst or in this field, it's a good reminder to take it upon yourself and just kind of review the most common cognitive biases for analysts. Um, these are something that just sneak into our uh, everyday work, I think. And it's just really good to remember to kind of fight bias and assumptions by um, thinking about the structured analytic techniques that we all learned back when we were starting out. So just want to leave you with that reminder. I hope it's helpful. Thank you very much. So, uh, Divya, any closing remarks, Any anything you would want to say? Yeah. First of all, thank you very much, Aparna, for just uh, giving us this platform to all women to just interact. And as uh, Rebecca also said, just to network further. And uh, in terms of just concluding, I would again uh, give out the importance of the intelligence inputs in corporate industry, which is Intelligence analysts, when effectively leveraged, act as a first line of defense in corporate security, so to speak. And their actionable threat intel can provide a comprehensive threat landscape, enabling uh, hopefully businesses to efficiently mitigate risks. So to all the companies and the leadership, I think we need to propagate more in terms of the community that you need intelligence inputs. Thank you. Thanks, thank you, Divya. Uh, Vipasha, your closing remarks. Yeah, firstly, thank you so much for giving us this platform. It's wonderful to hear from great minds over here. And uh, yes, as part of closing remarks, you know, uh, like Divya also correctly pointed out that corporates and leadership roles mustn't forget that, you know, there are there is a need and there is a consistent need for intelligence and information. And how to be how should that intelligence be presented is something which we as consultants should work on more and we should always be open to brighter ideas like currently what is happening with chat gpt and um, god knows what all is in the pipeline in terms of tech advancements and as consultants we should also look forward to leveraging on these technological tools to help our clients make better decisions thank you Thank you so much. Thank you, Vipasha. And thank you to all the panelists. You have been the game changers in your own right. And more power to you. Wish, you know, we, we please do join more of our sessions and let's have more interaction. But uh, whatever you have spoken uh, has been inspiring. And uh, I'm sure the audience has benefited immensely. Thank you so much to all our participants. Please do stay on. We have uh, uh, amazing discussions which are lined up and um, uh, thank you for the enthusiastic participation I would just request uh, the panelists to just check the Q&A box we haven't been able to take questions during the panel discussion but please feel free to uh, answer them and uh, with that thank you so much have a wonderful rest of the session and rest of the day everyone and uh, back to you Shreya thank you and thank you so much to all our panelists. I think it was a wonderful uh, start uh, to the kind of conversations that we are looking for, um, especially as an analyst myself. And I know so many other analysts here have joined and to get the kind of insights that we did today was an absolute privilege. Um, and thank you so much for sparing your time. 
uh, without uh, wasting any more time, I will now move on uh, to our next segment, which is the unveiling of the um, MidCAD Security Handbook. And if you just give me a second, I'd like to share my screen. Uh, Kunal, can you just confirm if my screen's on full screen? Yes. Yes. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, MidCAD's Women's Safety Handbook for 2023. Um, as we are seeing more and more increasing participation of women in the workforces, especially in the urban cities, uh, what we are seeing is a simultaneous increase um, in uh, the crimes against women as well. So MidCAD for many years has been producing uh, this uh, very useful document, which provides a focus on awareness uh, and safety for women uh, at a glance. So it basically covers uh, very, very salient points um, that can help you not only be aware of uh, the various uh, crimes uh, that uh, may occur or how you can uh, keep yourself safe in these situations and also provides excellent self-defense training inputs and tips. So it uh, starts with a general safety awareness uh, guideline co covering some important points on how you can actually um, keep yourself um, uh, safe in the environment that you are, especially when you are at work or while you're traveling outside uh, abroad um, for work as well and carrying out the duties of your organization. Uh, we often find ourselves um, in new places, in new situations, uh, which may be difficult uh, to assess or understand. So these are some quick tips that are available um, that you must keep in mind or keep it handy uh, in case you find yourself in a similarly precarious or risky situation, um, especially when you are at social gatherings or public places or um, uh, you know, and even at home. Another uh, aspect that has been well covered uh, in this handbook is the rising, uh, uh, which addresses the rising crime that we are seeing against women in the cyberspace. So uh, points like keep your webcam off and not required or uh, installing a good antivirus are some uh, quick tips uh, that you can take from this. And of course, um, one of the most important segments here uh, are the various uh, cyber crime cells that uh, you may reach out to or women can reach out to in case they are facing um, uh, these uh, problems. Then we have a list of, um, you know, the crimes against uh, women that have been described uh, or classified in the Indian Penal Code and the kind of punishments that follow and the act under which they come and the sections uh, that they come under. Uh, we also provide helpline numbers, uh, which, you, which uh, can be easily referred to in case of distress. Um, we then have the various types of redressal mechanisms that are available and um, women can reach out to in case they find themselves in these situations. Uh, we also provide a quick insight into legal guidelines because the first step uh, to actually getting justice or to making use of the laws that are in place is to have awareness about them and how you can actually uh, go about them in the first place. Uh, we then have an entire section on uh, sexual harassment at the workplace, um, how the systems have to be set up so that uh, women in the office space feel protected and have their rights in place. Um, what, are the, uh, what are the systems uh, that have to be put in and especially which are the non-governmental organizations that are there to help uh, with these processes as well. And most importantly, uh, we provide a list of self-defense tips uh, that um, you know your employees uh, that are working or traveling late at night or um, travel alone uh, can have a look at and uh, keep handy. With this, we come to um, you know the flagship uh, training modules that MidCat has developed, especially for women safety awareness and self-defense training. And we also provide training on prevention of sexual harassment at the workplace, uh, which are those POSH trainings. Uh, so in case you would like any more information or if you're interested in, re uh, in these trainings at your uh, office, you can reach out to uh, Mr. Kunal uh, Solanki. He has shared his uh, email ID um, in the chat box. Also, you can definitely follow MidCat on all uh, social media pages, which is Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, um, and you can always find these updates available to you um, in those places. Uh, with this, I now come to uh, the next segment, which is our second <clears throat> panel discussion, and uh, that is on women in resilience, sustainability, travel, and technology leadership. 
and we have uh, Mr. Malcolm Cooper, who is now going to be moderating this session, who he is the regional director of uh, the South at Midcat Advisory. He has 10 plus years experience, including military service, risk consulting and corporate real estate management. Uh, just a tip, he refused uh, to tell us more about himself. I think he likes to keep it low key. So I'm going to leave it to Malcolm to tell more about himself or if the panelists would like to get more information out of him. He's a real Intel guy <laughs> on the down low. Over to you, Malcolm. Thank you, Shreya. Thank you for that introduction. And thanks for putting me in a tough spot as well. Uh, good morning. Uh, everyone on this call, and uh, it is my honor to be a part of the moderating panel at the Visor event. Uh, to be honest, yes, uh, it is one of my first events that I am moderating, and I am extremely privileged to host uh, such powerful leaders in their own space. So uh, we start this panel uh, on a note of resilience and sustainability. Uh, both the topics are very close to our heart, especially close uh, to uh, where we stand as professionals as well. Uh, typically, we have always seen resilience and sustainability in two very separate buckets uh, until, you know, three years back when the pandemic hit us, we had minor conflicts all over Central Europe, which had ramifications globally. We are also seeing a plethora of natural disasters across the globe. What we want to achieve in this discussion is see where we stand uh, as a global community today, how specialists in resilience, sustainability, EHS, and security can provide value not only to their organizations, but to the community at large. So with, without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce my esteemed panelists in no particular order. Uh, and I would, if I've missed out, if, if anyone can please switch on their videos. Yes, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. So I'll start with Major Pramila Mohite. Uh, Pramila has over nine years of experience, distinguished service experience in the Indian Army and over 10 years of experience in the corporate field. She has excelled in various functions, challenging functions, such as material management, operations, procurement, administration, corporate real estate, and project management. She currently leads the administration and corporate real estate function at Alpha Laval. Thank you, uh, Major Pramila, and uh, we are absolutely delighted you could join us on this session today. Thank you so much, Malcolm. Uh, second, we have Rashmi Koyal. Rashmi is a very, very passionate EHS professional. She has over 15 years of experience in this field. She is an expert in creating new initiatives, which is very oriented towards EHS, resilience, and travel safety. She has a very, very close aim to continue to inspire women in various leadership roles and also to bring in more EHS specialists. Thank you, uh, Rashmi. And it's it's I really look forward to interacting with you today. My third panelist is Ratna Pawan. Ratna is a very, very well known in the consulting space. She has over two decades of experience in business continuity management and resilience. Her specialization for initiating programs in this demanding space includes a very challenging industry of banking and financial services for Standard Chartered, ABN, Ambro, SBC, and Yes Bank. This speaks volumes of her subject matter expertise. She currently leads the risk advisory initiatives at Ernst & Young. Ratna, it's a real pleasure having you, and I really look forward to learning from you. I'm glad to be here, Malcolm. My fourth panelist is across the strait in Singapore, Mary Helene Mansat. Mary Helene is a seasoned leader within various mission critical fields, such as safety, air defense, critical information systems, and cyber security. She currently leads 
the business development practice for access communications for the Asia Pacific region. And she is based in Singapore. So we will have very, very interesting things to talk about uh, with Mary as well. Mary, pleasure having you on board with us. Thank you so much for taking the time. Hi, hello everyone. Very happy to be here. Hello. My fifth panelist is Neeti Malik. Neeti is an absolutely seasoned professional with over two decades of experience. She has global business continuity program experience within organizations such as IBM, DXC, HP, Nortel, and she is now leading the business resilience practice at Concentrix. Neeti is a pioneering name within the BCM community, and she has spearheaded several innovating programs. Neeti, we look forward to hearing from you, and we will also discuss interesting initiatives which we can probably action on after this call. Thank and finally, so thank you so much, Malcolm. And it's indeed an honor to be around such a wonderful audience and panel. Thank you so much, Neeti. And finally, I would like to introduce you to Enis Clarissa Munir. Enis is based in Indonesia. She is the director at PT Accendo, a leading system integrator in Indonesia. She has over 12 years of experience as a security practitioner in projects associated to banking and financial services, and also a very, very demanding field of data centers. She is a leading board member of AISKINDO. Uh, that is a security community for those who are not aware. It's a security community in Indonesia, which has several leading practitioners who are practicing in the country and the region. Uh, Ines, pleasure having you, and we would love to hear on initiatives taken by you and what is trending in that industry, and we will also discuss certain risks as well. Hi, so, thank you. Hi, Ines. And glad to be able to join this panel. Thank you so much. And now, finally, we get down to business. Uh, we start with a few opening remarks and questions from our panelists. And I would like to take this opportunity to aim my first question at Ratna. Ratna, resilience and sustainability have so far been always correlated separately. We have seen resilience as a separate function, sustainability as a separate function, typically in various organizations. As we step out from our organizations into the larger community, do you feel that women leaders globally have been pioneers in creating systems which can mix in good practices of resilience functions and sustainability as well? And where do you think is the gap and how do we address it? Wow, Malcolm, that was a brilliant first question and I hope I remember all of it. Uh, but before I start, I'd like to really thank Midcat for having me, uh, for envisaging and promoting WISA and obviously special call outs to people like Colonel Sam, Pavan and Sushil with whom I have shared this stage at many an occasion in the past. Uh, but here's my take on what you just asked. And it's, like I said, an interesting question and a very relevant one for today's times. Uh, so sustainability, uh, according to me, and as defined uh, very loosely, is the ability to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, correct? Apart from energy sustainability and reducing carbon emissions, and that's the most well understood concept of sustainability on our minds, it has two other pillars that we often miss, which is the economic development and social equity. The end goal for sustainability is a world where every human has access to basic resources and we use those resources at a manageable rate so as not to run out of them and maintain the economic development. 
Moving on, resilience, on the other hand, refers to the ability to recover from, adapt to, and withstand disruptive events. There are many definitions for resilience, but I'm stating the one that's going to be relevant for understanding the correlation between sustainability and resilience. The resilience stance must be forward-looking, anticipating disruption rather than simply just reacting, but continuously learning and amending based on experience. Now, in terms of Correlation, Malcolm, sustainability and resilience are often seen as mutually reinforcing. And I don't think that's debatable. A sustainable system most often is also the most resilient system as it is designed to meet the long-term needs without compromising the capacity of the system to function effectively in the face of the future shocks or disruptions. Conversely, a resilient system is often more sustainable as it is able to adopt and respond to changing conditions without degrading the underlying resource base. For example, a sustainable agricultural system that promotes soil health and biodiversity is likely to be more resilient to climate change, drought, and other stresses. Fine. Now coming to how women can play a role here. And uh, I think Preeti in her keynote made very relevant mentions of how women are naturally stronger and more resilient. And these are the qualities that they bring to work as well, whether it is as global leaders of their countries or leaders within their respective functions in organizations. We all know that the women leaders actually handle the COVID pandemic better for their respective countries. And there's many a statistic that actually proves that, which means that they actually contributed to the sustainability of their countries as well. They recognize better, I would like to think, that crisis can only be addressed effectively if an enhanced agenda that acknowledges their interconnectedness or interconnectedness with sustainability for the longer term is adopted and embraced. Um, honestly, Malcolm, I can speak on and on, but I'd like to hand this over to you considering the time. Absolutely. And we will definitely get back on a few things that you had said. For example, social equity. I have noted this down. And this is something that we will circle back to at, at a, a, you know when we come to the end of our discussion. Sure. But uh, let's hold on to that important point that you had given on, on social equity. That, that's very, very relevant. Thank you, Ratna, so much. So uh, moving on to the next question, and I will aim this uh, you know, in, in the very same chain of resilience and the BCM professionals, Neeti. Neeti, you are working currently in a very large organization and you are leading the PCM practice. For what Ratna had said, for what the theme of the session is, do you still feel that there is a lack of initiatives to identify early diverse talent, especially women, specialists in fields such as STEM? Can they be brought in to the PCM continuity or the business continuity management field, do you feel that they will provide value? Because PCM is not something that many of us naturally step into. It's a journey over a, over a professional experience and we choose to move into business continuity management. How can we identify this young STEM talent, especially women specialists, and bring them into the fold of resilience and business continuity management and then give value to the organization? Thank you so much, Malcolm, for that question. And uh, my personal opinion, I would say, is, you know, obviously identifying the right talent at the right time, uh, looking at, you know, the traits that we really want to see in uh, women who are essentially leading resilience or, you know, crisis management or disaster management and some of those functions. I'd say, you know, some of the common traits I would look at in women, and this is not specific to, uh, I would say, uh, just this industry, but anywhere we, we, we are looking at women leaders. Uh, one, we need people who are focused towards their goals. We need people who are bold enough to question the status quo, right? We have certain things that, have, that are developed today and we want to look at certain things that, uh, you know, that are upcoming. Uh, we want people 
who believe in themselves and can be sure that, yes, I can do it. Uh, we want people who can rely on themselves and adapt to, to the environment that they are in. And of course, most important, we need people who are extraordinarily resilient. Now with that, obviously, uh, I would say uh, we can start right from the educational institutions. We can start from, you know, people, you know, who are already in the industry and possibly looking at, you know, man manning our emergency operation centers, the part of various teams within our organizations. I am personally a fan of, you know, um, encouraging the right talent within different teams and possibly mentoring them and bringing them to the fore and, you know, getting them to train uh, uh, under me and possibly, you know, giving them the right positions when it really comes to that. Uh, I, I personally feel, you know, mentoring is a very, very important tool uh, that can really help us, one, identify the right talent, guide them in the right, with the right skills, uh, you know, teach them what are the pot potential certifications, what are the potential elements that they can bring in, and, uh, and then giving them the right opportunity, right? Uh, I mean, uh, I, I would say, you know, yesterday there was a woman leader who guided me and possibly that's why I'm here talking to you. Similarly, we would love to do that to, you know, many aspiring people, your, our, our aspiring women who would like to come to this field and possibly uh, learn a little more and then, you know, develop into effective leaders per se. Yes, Niti, that's bang on. And one aspect which I'm going to take from, from what you have shared is mentoring. So I've put multiple geometric boxes around that word. So we will once again circle back. So I'm trying to take sound bites from everybody during, you know, your answers and we will try and put together uh, what is the key learning from this exercise. Thank you so much, Niti. Thanks, Satan. Uh, Thanks, Mark. My, my next question is uh, targeted uh, to Major Pramila. Uh, Pramila, post the pandemic, of course, I'm sorry, I'm once again sounding like a broken record post-pandemic, post-pandemic. We have learned that the corporate real estate profile has become extremely dynamic. Decisions associated with workspace services, travel, projects in facilities, and business decisions are now driven on vast amount of data, which traditionally would not have been seen before. Obviously, this is due to several economic restrictions that we have seen. But what is the value that you see in having diverse insights specifically from women subject matter experts, which can add value to workspace resilience and workspace related business decisions? Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you for that question. A very good morning uh, to Midcat Advisory team. Thank you for initiating such a lovely uh, project theme Visor 2023. I'm proud to be a part of this. And a warm welcome uh, to uh, and a good morning to all the panelists here as well. It would be uh, a good opportunity to interact with all of you. And thank you, Colonel Sam, Malcolm, of course, you and Kunal for having me here together. Uh, coming to corporate real estate, I'm going to answer the last bit, Malcolm, uh, at the end, uh, because there's a twist to uh, uh, that of the perspective that a women leader brings to the table. Uh, corporate real estate, uh, I would say today, in today's scenario, is a very strategic role. And when I say it is a strategic role is because corporate real estate administration and facilities basically forms a broader part of human resource management, that is people management. And when it comes to people management, it is aligning your strategic execution to the strategic intent of any corporate or an organization. And therefore the corporate real estate uh, today becomes uh, extremely important in the scenario of facilities and properties and workspaces, et cetera. Now, coming to uh, the employee per se, the people management per se, the internal stakeholder delight. And when I say the internal stakeholder delight, it is the employee delight. When we prepare our employees to be business ready in a stress-free environment, creating hospitality structure to the manner which we business ready the employee to go launch and get the business. 
So that is internal stakeholder delight that the uh, CRE specialists aim at. Uh, coming to workspace management, you know, and here I would like to share uh, what Alpha Laval India also did uh, during pandemic is creating a space uh, in a manner which is collaborative, which forces the employee to come uh, to office, interact, network, strategically network with employees, bring out uh, and create incubations, bring out business ideas, uh, use design thinking and many other concepts. And there are many other perspectives when you meet employees in office. Here is the main role of corporate real estate managers of how they have created the facilities technically sound, aligning to compliances, aligning to legalities, and creating a safe weather and atmosphere for the employees to, uh, you know, uh, business cope. Having said that, we have created, uh, uh, during pandemic, we started in 2019, 2020, and 2021. All those who are in Pune are welcome to come and see the uh, massively global footprint structure that Alpha Laval has created for its employees. And I must say, Malcolm, employees come to office just because the property, the corporate office, is made in a manner which is collaborative. It is women-centric also. It is safe for the women. It has crash. It has uh, technical STPs. It has a lush green atmosphere that has been created around. And thus, uh, the complete hospitality is completely met with. And it creates uh, a safe weather for employees to interact with each other. Coming to travel risk management, um, uh, you know, when it comes to travel uh, per se as a subject and travel, when I say uh, it includes the complete cycle of air travel, hotels uh, and uh, business car rentals, uh, it's a subject which is successful when you have crisp policies made, when you have crisp SOPs made. And when all of this is together stitched with a good RFP and you have the best vendor on board, I think 50% of your problems in the corporate are resolved and the employee uh, by methodology of using digital portals to be self-sustained and self-use such portals, I think your problems are achieved. Second is uh, the international SOS. And of course, what Midcat Advisory also provides uh, are uh, the safety sound uh, uh, buttons, the panic buttons, uh, which are uh, you know engaged with our employees on a regular basis. There's regular training given and uh, there is regular communication that is given. Uh, coming to communication, the subject itself, uh, we place primary importance in communicating with the employees uh, with regular trainings of explaining the processes, the policies, the international SOSs, activating the travel desk and where the TMC, the travel management company also plays an important role. All this uh, conglomeration and collaboration has happened because we have had uh, the best global, uh, you know, market benchmarked uh, RFPs, uh, which we have onboarded, and we have the best vendors on board. So going for local vendors is not our priority. In this scenario for travel related services, we definitely go in for, um, you know, global um, uh, vendors as such. And this has been my experience. Corporates always select uh, the best uh, vendors. Now coming to the digital portal, uh, Malcolm, it is uh, uh, the primary importance and it lays the foundation for your uh, communication, cost optimization. When you have your digital portals, when you have your dashboards, you have enough figures to take business de uh, decisions and uh, you know create a budget and optimize your costs accordingly. So digital portal in the scenario of CRE has also played an extreme uh, importance. Now, uh, coming to all this, and when you ask me, the question is, uh, are women leaders? You know, here I, I slightly am against the subject of women leading it. I think it is the competencies of a CRE, uh, you know, leader uh, who could uh, drive this. Now, twisting it a bit. Why women leaders fit into a CRE specialized role is definitely because they are naturally resilient leaders. And the creative thinking, the idea, innovation, and certain design thinking concepts that a women leader can naturally bring to the table 
is what uh, you know perspective that I hold, and I think in the past twenty years, this um, uh, you know competency uh, based in terms of uh, bringing uh, a complete nurturer effect to the hospitality section is what the women leader plays. So I have many uh, CRE specialists in my network who are male, who are gentlemen, uh, you know, uh, who do that. But then uh, why women achieve that upper end is because she's naturally resilient. Uh, she's a nurturer, she's a caregiver. And um, these days, uh, you know, uh, women are so uh, conscious about uh, learning uh, specialized subject matters. I think there they play an uh, exemplary role and bring out uh, the true women leader in them. Malcolm, I hope I have answered your uh, query. Certainly. Thank you so much uh, for, for that very, very comprehensive uh, answer. Uh, design thinking, People management relates to strategic intent is, is what I am taking out and putting in, uh, in, in a nice symmetric box in, in my notes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Pramila. Thank you, Malcolm. Now, moving on to the next uh, uh, participant, uh, Rashmi. Uh, Rashmi. Uh, Hi. Welcome on board. And a short question for you. I think, personally, I feel that EHS has always traditionally been a very, very male dominated profession, primarily because uh, the roots of HSC or EHS have started from the industrial age, from a manufacturing setup, and then it has branched out. Of course, things have changed right now. We still don't see EHS professionals in the corporate sector. Very, very few corporates have specific EHS business heads or specific EHS team members. Most of the responsibility is also you know, branched out and given to various departments. A two-pronged question to you. Why do you feel that any amount of EHS representation is important in every organization? And how can we push for employing women EHS specialists especially coming to the point which uh, a lot of our fellow panelists had brought out, they are naturally resistant uh, leaders and they have a much, much broader perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you for the question. A very good afternoon to everyone. Um, thanks, Mitcat advisory team for inviting me to Wiser 2023. It will make me wiser uh, sharing the platform with such eminent speakers. So thanks, Malcolm. Um, so the question is split into two. So why a touch or a dash of EHS is required in any organization and why, uh, you know, women can bring women uh, leadership or women uh, representation can bring a difference to the EHS, if I've heard you correctly. So um, let me start uh, with saying this, that uh, again, I, I will, um, you know, uh, second the thought which uh, Major Pramila, Pramila shared that, uh, you know, a role has to be competence specific and not gender specific. Certainly, yeah. And uh, uh, EHS is required in any organization to bring the perspective of managing the risks. Yeah, any organization for that matter will have certain risks, certain latent risks that are not visible to the people until and unless it is brought to the eyes of the people. Yeah, which is why it is extremely important to have the function. If it, it, it the organizations have started to come up with this vertical, if not distinguished in some way or the other, to, to recognize and appreciate that they have certain amount of risks in, in their organization. How do they manage the risks? How do they bring control measures so that they keep their employees safe? They keep their reputation safe in, it, out, in the outside world because the stakeholders as well outside are looking for organizations who can vouch for the safety and well-being of their people. Yeah. And uh, you know, to continue to that, a diverse team is required in EHS as an organization. Yeah, not only women, uh, uh, you know, diversity and inclusion is required in the whole team. Now, why? I'll come to that, and then I'll come to the second part. Why women? A diverse team is required. Uh, you know, to bring the perspective of uh, you know bringing the pick. Uh, for example, let's let's pick up people from different culture, different background. Let's say somebody is coming from an industrial background or somebody is coming from purely a corporate background. They will have their own sense of 
uh, appreciating the risks available, risks present in the organization, and collectively they can they can bring the value of controlling those uh, risks. You know, putting in the control measures, uh, diversity in terms of communication. So when you have appreciated your risks, when you have acknowledged your risks you've put in control measures, it is important to communicate them to your people so that they also value the efforts put behind this as a vertical as the organization, yeah? So people speaking different languages or coming from different background, they put a different flavor to this entire perspective, yeah? Then having such team can also bring in innovative ideas, creativity to keep the subject alive. Because EHS, you know, at times tend to take a back seat because it is it does not bring business. You know, people are like sales driven, number driven organization. So EHS uh, would, uh, you know, would not bring per se a number or a sales to you, but it will definitely keep your sales force safe so that they can bring in the business. Yeah. So hence a diverse EHS um, team is, is required in the organization to actually start with understanding the risks that are there. Now coming to the second part of the question, um, why women? Yeah, a very, very interesting topic again, why women? So, um, well, uh, all of you would understand that, yes, we, we are all uh, taking up various leadership roles. You know, there are increasingly number of uh, women taking up roles. However, there are very specific challenges in the organization, yeah? So, uh, for example, if, if you have to make it favorable for a female, to be a part of the leadership role, especially in EHS or any other function in, 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 in an organization. How, what, what is the turnaround on this? How, how do you turn the table? So to support the women in such roles, please make sure, I mean, the organizations must ensure that you have very conducive environment to kind of have them, give them flexibility to work uh, because they, as, as again, uh, my co-speakers said, uh, you know, they are, they are naturally resilient. You know, they, they know they have the tendency to um, to to work on, on various things together. They are multitaskers naturally. Yeah. So to make them work efficiently in an organization and in EHS, uh, the organizations must have a conducive environment wherein you have flexible working policy. You have safe communication channels where you know, they can report any incident of harassment or you have, you know, most of all, you should have a cooperative team around. You know, when a woman is there and on the team, they should appreciate that she might have specific challenges to address, which, uh, you know, not to sound biased, but a man would not have, or probably she has to cater to domestic responsibilities more than a man. So she needs that balance, a work-life balance, you know, in her life. So, uh, and then, uh, you know, a mentorship program or a training all such elements put together can actually facilitate, um, you know, having women on the team in the organization. So um, again, um, you know, I have talked about the barriers, like, you know, if you don't have conducive policies, if you don't have flexibility, uh, you know, if you're not uh, upgrading the skills and competence, because, you know, th there is a mental block that, um, X and Y, for X, Y, Z reasons, we will not be able to give this opportunity to a female because she may not be able to devote as much time as her counter male colleague. Yeah. So the need of the R is a paradigm shift that though she comes with additional responsibilities, she's as good a co-worker, a colleague, a leader, a team member as a man. Yeah. So there is no difference uh, in, in that. So yeah, on that note, um, I, I, the, I, I rest my case and this is my submission that again, if you're talking about women empowerment or feminism, then it's not about making women stronger because they are naturally strong. It's about changing the way the world perceives the strength, the power in men. Yeah, so that's Thank my submission, Malcolm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rashmi. And you know, I have noted down an important point that you said is policies. Uh, a conducive yeah. policy, uh, inclusive for everyone. I think that's the step that organizations should take, no matter what their size. So that that's that's okay. the soundbite that I can take. Thank you so much, Rashmi. Moving on to the next uh, speaker, Mary. Mary, you have been associated in several high-profile mission-critical projects. There is a topic which interests a lot of us uh, at Midcat as well, and a lot of consultants globally. 
smart cities is a buzzword especially in the asia pacific region several countries in this region including india have smart city projects lined up in various stages however considering today's global scenario how do you feel that an approach should be taken to make these projects oriented towards safety resilience and sustainability how important is it to bring it in like we had discussed from our, uh, our co speakers as well design concept how important is it to have a well thought of design concept in the initial stages of any smart city and how do you see is a value to women specialists uh, working on these projects yeah thank you thank you malcolm to have me here and thank you to colonel sam to suggest my name um yeah, my pleasure to be here, and I like very much this uh, smart city topic. Uh, this is super important to me because women are usually approaching cities not only from the smart side of things, but also cities that are safer and livable uh, for them and for the family. So let me go through these three dimension of the smart city, the smarter, safer, and livable cities. Uh, smart to me is about being a connected city and with the deployment of 5G in APAC in several countries and the internet of things, for example, that may offer more services to the citizens. And this is also including uh, smart public transportation and smart mobility in the city. And to me, safer is about increasing the safety and the security level in the city, such as what's happening in India currently with having uh, dedicated carriages in metro trains reserved for women only or for women with children. This kind of initiative is really contributing to build a safer city. And to me, this is also about having video surveillance cameras in the streets, especially, especially around schools, around the place of worship, and in public transports. So, and also this is about having critical communication system to alert citizens in case of hurricane or flooding or disaster happening in a city. So, livable to me is about enjoying really walking in a city and uh, this resonates very much with um, uh, what has been said by uh, Maj uh, Major Pramila about having an environment in the office that that is women friendly uh, so I would say uh, this is about walking living learning playing also eating uh, in the city and uh, this matters for everyone, uh, woman or man, adult, child, for both pro personal and professional lives. So this is for everyone. So therefore, we need people taking decision at the city government level to be as diverse as possible in gender, age, ethnicity, background, back to what Rashmi mentioned earlier. I fully agree with that. That's super important to have a diverse team to take decision because we want everyone to, um, to feel good in the city and everyone has not the same needs or the same aspiration. Uh, it seems to me that women have a more holistic view and this, is, this was mentioned by uh, Arpana, I think in the first panel. I, I really believe that women have a more holistic view of a city and should be more involved in taking decision for that. And then I'd like to move on the, on the woman behavior. And um, I like what has been said by Niti uh, Malik earlier. Um, we need some role model and uh, being soft does not mean being not strong or not being brave. Uh, think about Jacinda Arden that has been mentioned by uh, Preeti in her opening speech. I mean, 
she has been able to show compassion, to, 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 to exhibit some soft things, but she's a strong woman. So this is something to, to, be, to be taken uh, into account. So I would, look, I would like also to add something in my area, which is about video surveillance and critical communications. Uh, we are currently facing a shortage of human resources in almost all APAC countries. So this is including jobs such as sales engineer, after sales support engineer, sales executive, guards, security guards, cybersecurity experts, etc. On guards, maybe you have noticed that we see more and more women that are guards. And now, I mean, after COVID, and it was mainly men uh, a, a few years ago. So being in the security market uh, without considering that women can bring to me, it's like ignoring half of the potential resources that are available. I like what is mentioned in that book. I'm not sure you know that book. It's uh, Sun Tzu, Art of War for Women. I strongly recommend that book. <laughs> it is a revisited version of the Art of War for Women. And they say something like, why going to the battle with one arm on your back? So you are with your sword and one arm on the back. I mean, this is what you do if you uh, do not leverage on half of the resource that you have. So you need to have both hands to, for, to fight. That's why you need to bring men in your workforce and women. You need both. And uh, so to me, that's uh, really uh, super important. And how to change the, my, the, the mindset and to bring more women in the STEM, in the... Um, to me, as a parent, we need to start with also make uh, toys available for both girls and, and, and boys. I mean, uh, dolls, Legos, car toys, planes to both, make them available to both, I mean, boys and girls. And um, to me, I, I, when I was a child, I liked very much the, the Legos and building things. I, I just ignored those. So, uh, that's not mean I'm not a woman. <laughs> so I think that's that's important to start to to really um, remove those stereotypes from from the childhood. And um, as an um, experienced uh, female professional in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, I, I I agree with what has been said before about mentoring. I was mentored when I was young myself, and I think it was Niti man mentioning that. And now uh, it's super important for me to mentor young professional, because to me, it's a way to give back to the so society what I, what I get earlier. So to me, that's really, um, really super important. And I, I'd like to end also with, um, for, for women here that are in the security, and I think there's a lot of them uh, today with us, uh, an association like ASIS Association, A-S-I-S, -S, ASIS Association. Uh, it's about security professional and most of the chapters in all countries, they have a, a women in security group. And personally, I'm leading that group in the Singapore chapter. And uh, I think uh, Kirsten earlier in the first um, panel, she recommended to join those kind of association. And I would like to recommend that one because to me, that's very valuable because you are not alone, you can share with other women. So that's really uh, good to be there. Over to you, Malcolm. Thank you so much, Mary. Your, your insights were really fascinating. Uh, you know, you have so wonderfully brought out what all your other co-speakers have also said. Uh, I, I really like your statement on how you approach a smart city in, in and the decision makers have to be as diverse as possible. I think that also equates to what Ratna had stressed uh, when she was correlating resilience and uh, sustainability in terms of social equity. Uh, I think that that's very important uh, to be considered as well. So it, it really gels uh, seamlessly into, into what you had said as well, Marie. Thank you so much. Uh, moving on and, and to, to the last uh, speaker. And, and I, I'm, I'm really hoping that we'll get a lot of insights, which, which normally we don't know. Ines, uh, you are based in Indonesia. Indonesia is on the 
cusp of multifold growth. Uh, lot of growth stories emanating from the country. The concept of China plus one has resonated, resonated in a lot of companies. And you know, along with India and other countries, uh, China plus one is also moving on to Indonesia. So you have tremendous growth in Indonesia in a lot of spaces like data center, et cetera. You also have a new capital which is coming up in Indonesia. You have a lot of study on environmental risks in Indonesia. Now, especially considering that there are several organizations which are setting up shop in Indonesia to facilitate the China plus one strategy. How important is it to introduce at this very stage, at the very early stage, the concept of employing women security specialists in the field in Indonesia? And what do you see are the major challenges uh, associated with that, your honest opinion, and how can we probably go ahead and further collaborate? And Mary, you had also, Mary had also mentioned that there is a shortage of jobs uh, and, and this was a very, very interesting insight. Shortage of specialists. How do we employ these specialists and bring value to companies, especially in, in, in Indonesia? Uh, Ines, uh, over to you. Hi, Malcolm. Thank you for uh, giving that wonderful insights about Indonesia as well and having me uh, today on this panel. Thank you, Midcap, for arranging as well. Um, yes, yeah, speaking on the growth of Indonesia, maybe I take on that note first. In 2014, actually, our president, Pa uh, Joko Widodo, have this movement of having 100 um, capital cities, smart, smart capital cities, which is uh, the topic that Mary was just highlighted earlier. So, um, it was run quite successfully, starting with the three first major cities in Indonesia, which is Jakarta, the main capital city uh, right now, and then Bandung in uh, West Java and Surabaya in East Java. So, and now uh, this is starting in 2014, right? So now in 2022, there are over 97 cities that are already being awarded with uh, the, the title of the smart city. And the uh, government itself, as you mentioned, is going to move the capital city from Jakarta to the new capital city in 2024. So there are a lot of money and a lot of projects going on here in Indonesia. Uh, about almost uh, 400 billion US dollars are required to actually uh, make this project success successful. And this project actually hopefully giving us more capacity in creating jobs, improve lives, and more economic growth opportunities and bring out, uh, lift out all more properties, properties from Indonesia market, right? So, and uh, this new capital city and this smart city project actually embodies six pillars of a smart cities, which is smart governance, smart people, smart economy, smart mobility, smart living standards, and a smart environment, combining technologies to bring out all the six pillars. So um, interestingly, speaking about women in this industry as well. So one of the most successful implementation of the smart cities are actually in uh, Surabaya, East Java. So the, the governor at that time was actually a woman. So she was, uh, she, her name is uh, Ibu Risma. So now Ibu Risma is no longer the governance of the Surabaya uh, city and she becoming the uh, social minister. So because of her great work that she has done in the city to, to make Surabaya uh, one of the most successful cases of the smart city. So uh, I mean, commenting to what Mary just said, being diverse. So this, uh, luckily us in Indonesia, we have this one exemplary who are women that is innovative uh, and enough to actually break the rules uh, and spoke her mind to make this project successful because to implement something new in Indonesia with our um, with our uh, mostly men as well in the industry as well not maybe not not just in the security but in the minister level in the government's level there are mostly women uh, mostly men so less women right she she has to break that uh, stigma 
and and make sure that uh, in her innovation and her thinking in implementing the technology is is successful and she did it so she managed to use smart technology to creating smart govern governments with using e procurement uh, making smart technology creating programs to those underprivileged youth and giving them opportunities to lift up the uh, poverty in surabaya installing uh, seriously uh, smart security as well using IoT technology, having in cameras implemented to make sure that children's, women's, people are safe uh, in the city. So um, looking and looking at your second questions, I I think there are, yet yeah, there's still not a lot of women uh, in the industry actually um, uh, joining this, this movement, but, I do hope that by having her and having a few great women in the uh, government in Indonesia, uh, giving examples of having a holistic, creating that, uh, moving that boundaries as well, that women can do it. Women can have that ability to having that balance in her life uh, and mentoring other women as well in the industry to make sure that we can um, be more proactive in industry as well. But yeah, in my opinion, I do, I do hope that we will see more women joining, joining the industry as well uh, by having marketing, giving more marketing, uh, telling that women can make it in technologies, I think, uh, that's a very good example that we have. That that was great, uh, Ines. I, I think I absolutely agree with you. And we are coming once again, time and again, on this whole aspect of mentoring. So uh, I think all of us have come to a common conclusion that mentoring is very, very important. Uh, and we know now that there is a market. It's not that there, there, is, uh, there is a shortage. There is a requirement. There is a market. There is a need. Uh, in not only the industry, but as the, the overall community as a whole. So uh, thank you, everyone. I think this, this was what is were absolutely wonderful uh, insights. Uh, I think there are a few Q and A's and, and you know, I would request you all to take that in case it's, you do see that separately. Uh, we, we are a little short of time, but I will still take this opportunity if you know, we can start with you, Ines, since you're still on camera. Uh, and you're in front of my screen, just a 30 second, uh, a 10 to 20 second or a maximum 30 second sound bite on what are your closing remarks. Uh, and, you know, we can then close this panel. In Ines, over to you. Yeah, thank you everyone for having me and joining the Wiser 2023 panel. So I hope that there will be more of this kind of event empowering uh, women in the futures, especially in the security industry. Thank you, Metcat, for arranging uh, the full panel as well. Thank you, Ines. Pleasure interacting with you. We will definitely interact more closely. Uh, you've really given some amazing insights uh, on, on the region. Uh, Ratna, uh, over to you. Sure, Malcolm. So I'd like to honestly end with, uh, you know, I recently read the Forbes, uh, the world's 100 most powerful women, the 2022 series, a list which is determined by four major metrics, which is money, media, impact, and spheres of influence. And what really hit me was this statistic where uh, amongst the traditional power players, there are 39 CEOs, 10 heads of state, and 11 billionaires, I'm talking women, worth a combined $115 billion, right? And there's so so many inspirational stories there for all of us. My message to every woman listening in is that wherever we are, whatever we do, we can definitely contribute. We can play a role. We can inspire. We can knock on those glass ceiling. Every single bit counts, including mentoring. That's it from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ratna. Uh, Rashmi, over to you. Thank you. Um, a, a huge round of applause to uh, the organizers of, of this Wiser Forum. Thank you so much for having me. And, and I completely agree with, to what my co-speakers have shared. So uh, just a last concluding thought that, um, you know, each one of us are very different and hence all of us are so special. 
so all of us should look uh, at one another with that lens of uh, you know fairness and look for somebody who can lead with power and who's empathetic towards the role and women do come with that empathetic attribute so bring in more leaders bring in more women and diversity in the organization and you will see the change so thank you on that note thank you so much thank you so much rashmi it was a pleasure having you on board uh neeti over to you thanks well malcolm and it's indeed been a pleasure listening to so many wonderful leaders around i think we're glad to be around in an era that has seen a spurt in participation of women in a variety of industries and today women are truly cracking the industry's glass ceiling achieving double digit gains and you know picking up roles making slow and steady progress and bridging the gender gap my message to you know all the uh, women leaders and all those aspiring women leaders you know be the best version of yourself and that's what you should always strive to be um learn to like yourself a little more uh you don't have to worry about being the prettiest the funniest the smartest or the most popular one around so thank you for that one thank you so much neeti thank you for your kind words uh, mary over to you yeah thank you thank you to for having me here uh to me i have two advice that i would like to deliver to female professionals here the first one is take the stage convey this message that diversity will bring more success to organizations and be very clear about it no need to 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 have strong way to deliver it but just be firm and clear and show and bring facts and some of us have been doing that so that's my first advice take the stage and voice something for diversity and the the second one is that i'm sure that you get support at home vis-a-vis what you want to achieve professionally because it's so difficult if you have to fight both at home vis-a-vis your life partner and at work to become a strong leader it's too difficult to fight on both sides so i'm sure you get support from your life partner you get support from your parents children whoever you have at home and that people will support you in what you want to achieve in your career that's super important and this will make you feel really much much better thank you thank you thank you so much for those words of wisdom thank you uh and finally uh, uh major pramila uh, any advice or any sound bites that you would like to share with us yeah thank you malcolm uh, uh, after listening to all the strong women leaders you see uh, malcolm women are naturally born strong leaders and in my perspective especially in asian countries you know due to the demographies and uh, the legacy of culture there is a subconscious fear uh, of the opposite uh, 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 gender being more stronger i'm a firm believer uh, to overcome this and of course i'm doing many projects uh, around this uh, you will see a podcast soon uh, from my end on this subject the first is uh, uh, self learning self learning is a progressive attitude that today's women must adopt and it is a process of learning relearning and unlearning time and ag- again self consciously the second aspect is strategic networking you know when all the leaders here today were talking about support system and uh, facilitating each other and lifting each other up i think strategic networking amongst women leaders uh, to pick each other up would play a very very important role in uh, voicing it up uh, like mary rightly said uh the last uh, and uh, of course you will see a, a podcast from me soon is creating your own authentic brand your personal branding women leaders today must achieve a personal branding for themselves be the authentic you and there is a lot of technicalities of uh, communication strategic networking strategic communication all these aspects and last definitely voice it up and definitely speak up when you demand you get it so the fear should be overcome by you know demanding it of course in a firm manner uh, not in a manner that would not suit the environment madam thank you thank you so much ma'am it was a real pleasure having you thank you and- so much thank you mitcat
with this, uh, we end this uh, session and over to you, Shreya. Thank you so much to all my fellow panelists uh, for taking the time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so everyone. much, uh, Malcolm, you. and to all the boss women on this panel, my God, it was uh, so uh, wonderful to hear everybody and all the insights. And I loved the little strategic connection, connecting going on in the chat box as well. And that's exactly what these conferences and seminars are all about. It's about sharing best practices, uplifting each other. And uh, Malcolm, thank you uh, for making your debut on this very special visor um, uh, you know, uh, conference, because uh, not only is it great for women to come together and support each other, but it's equally important for men, the most important stakeholders to come along, and it's important to move on this together. So I really appreciate that. Uh, with this, I would just like to make a small announcement before we move on to our very next special uh, keynote uh, by Ingrid Toppelberg, and that is that we have now released um, the India Risk Review and the Asia Risk Review. So if anybody is interested in receiving the hard copies or the physical copies, you can reach out to Mr. Kunal Solanki or Mr. Sagar Bhanushali, and they will be sharing their contact details in the chat box. And for those who are interested in the Women's Safety Handbook, you can easily download that from our LinkedIn uh, page or our website, and it should be available um, at the end of the day. Uh, with this now, I would just quickly introduce and not take too much time. Um, so we have a special keynote address by uh, Ms. Ingrid Toppelberg. She is the Chief Digital Transformation Officer at Thrive DX. And she will be delivering her, um, uh, her note on women in technology and innovation, empowering ourselves to become innovative, forward-thinking future leaders and change agents. So at Thrive DX, Ingrid develops relevant, best-in-class oriented programs for individuals entering the growing cybersecurity field or seeking to advance their cybersecurity careers. In addition to her role at TDX, she currently serves as a head coach for the prestigious Massachusetts Institute of Technology boot camps. Welcome, Ingrid. Thank you so much for making the time and joining us today. And uh, with this, I now hand over to you. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Very excited to be here. Thank you, uh, Midcat, for inviting me to. So today, I want to talk about how can we empower ourselves. Before, uh, there was a lot of talk about mentorship and support and community. And absolutely, all of this we need to do. But I want to focus on something that's a little more personal. And sometimes we are the ones that are limiting ourselves the most. And what I want to talk about is about imposter syndrome and how can we do to get out of this. So I don't need to tell you the statistics about there's not a lot of women in tech. We are usually different. Uh, so it, it's hard to find people that we can relate to. If you look at my career, objectively, I've been very successful. I've worked at McKinsey. I studied at MIT. I teach for MIT. Now I'm a C-level in the biggest cyber education company uh, in the world. And still, I'm always wondering, oh, like, do I really need to, do I really deserve to be here? Is this really my place? Do I belong? It can get very overwhelming. So usually some of us, I'm not saying all of us, but some of us, we kind of get like uh, socialized into the belief that we need to be flawless. And there's different types of flawless. There's a type of flawless like the perfectionist, uh, like so you cannot make mistakes, the soloist, so the kind that you need to do everything on your own, the expert that you need to know anything, everything, or the natural genius. It's like I, I should be able to you know, handle a family, handle a job and, and everything like without a lot of effort. And um, you know, this is great. <laughs> But it can be exhausting because what also happens is that we think that we need to be flawless, but we also do not own our successes. So when we actually succeed, for example, like if you look at me, it's like, okay, well, but you enter MIT, you got into MIT, you must, you know, you must have done something. What we do is that we explain it away. So we say things like, 
oh, it wasn't me, I was just lucky, or I had help, so it's not really me, or they just like me, they only accepted me because they liked me, uh, and if I can do it, anybody can. It was an admissions mistake. I've heard once an MIT professor that had been at MIT for 20 years say that she still believes that the only reason why she got accepted was because before the admissions interview, there had been a wine and cheese reception. And so the people that interviewed her had drunk some wine and hence, they were drunk when they interviewed her, not that she actually deserved to be there. And she carried this belief for 20 years in her career. So this can be very exhausting. And I'm sure some of you know this, this internal dialogue that we have. Now, how did we make it this far? You know, if we just keep working and but we don't believe that we are actually deserving to be here, we have certain coping mechanisms to keep going. So one of the things we do is that we fly under the radar. So if people don't see the, me, then like, it's okay. They are not going to expose that they don't really belong here. Sometimes we procrastinate and we never start or finish something because as long as I don't try, then I can't fail. We overwork ourselves. We work ourselves to death just to prove that we deserve to be here. Sometimes we also blame others. And I'm sure each of you have your own strategies, but the truth is that by having this, uh, this belief that we don't belong to be here and having these coping mechanisms that allow us to keep growing and growing, but we still don't feel it and we still don't own it, we're just trapped in a, in a vicious cycle that doesn't allow us to, to grow, to innovate, to be happy, to enjoy life, enjoy our success and be more confident of ourselves. So. What is this? This at the end is, is, is just a belief, right? And beliefs are uh, acceptance that a statement is true or that something exists. So they are great because they help us make decisions, but they, if they are unconscious, they can make us a lot of uh, harm. They can be formed through, through our family. They can be observed in our community, in our country. They can be learned through experience or we can choose them. But it's very important that we make these beliefs uh, conscious so that we can actually see it's like, does this make sense? Is this really true? Am I really not belonging here? Do I really not deserve to be here? Is everybody else better than me? So I really encourage you to take a few minutes after the sessions today and think what are your core beliefs about who you are, your work and your belonging and think about that. Now, Good news is that we can change our beliefs. Uh, and there are a lot of different ways that you can do this. I'm going to mention a few things because I think I only have one more minute uh, or two more minutes. Uh, so a few things that you can do. One, meditation, 15 minutes per day, not a lot, just sit there and breathe. And this can help you uh, increase the, the reaction time between stimulus and response and creating this space will allow you to observe, oh, that's a belief, I don't necessarily, that's not necessarily true, I can change it. Another great thing that you can do is we, we really only see what we focus on. So sometimes it's better to make an effort to see all the positives that we're not really seeing. So every night, sit down and think, what are my achievements today? I'm sure you achieve those things every day. Think about the small achievements. Don't, don't like, oh yeah, well, the day that I start a company, I'll have succeeded. No, you have small achievements every day. Like put your focus on that, recognize that and congratulate yourself because you are awesome. Focus on gratefulness. Think about three, three things every night. You can think about three things that you're grateful for in your day. It doesn't have to be peace in the world or health. It can be small things. It can be this very cute flower that I saw when I went out. It can be uh, meeting a friend and having a really open conversation. It can be a lot of very different things. But if we don't consciously put our focus on it, it will be hard for us to, like we'll keep focusing on the things that are harder and we'll lose this opportunity. 
share. We're not alone. Community is super important, especially when it looks like we're alone because we're not alone. Share, get together with other women. I've been, um, all my career, I was always like one of the few women. And now I got to have like a team of women and I see the radically difference uh, that it creates in having others with me that can share, you know, they know when I'm going through that like down, the down when I'm doubting myself and they can highlight that on me and I can support them also. Uh, and other things like journaling, playing, enjoying life, giving love, helping others. Uh, so I think I'm out of time. So thank you very much. I really hope this can help you uh, own who you are a little more. You are amazing, you're awesome. So the world will be better if you shine brighter. So you deserve it. Uh, let's leave our imposters behind and let's shine together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ingrid. I cannot thank you enough for bringing out such an important topic. Um, I think women everywhere, especially, um, we are so focused on building skill and on like going up the ladder and not letting us um, letting our vulnerabilities out. But um, definitely, imposter syndrome is something that is a problem. And uh, you know, sometimes it's just good to have your self confidence in place um, at the same time as building your skills. So I really thank you very very much for making the time and bringing out such an important point. And I can see in the chat box that the audience is a, a, a very appreciative and uh, thankful for what you have shared today. And I do hope that you stay on um, for the next panel and um, do answer questions that you see come your way. Uh, and I'm so sorry that we are <laughs> tight on time. We would have loved to hear more from you. Um, so thank you so much. Um, thank you, you too. With this, uh, we now go on to our panel discussion, number three, which is Women in Security Leadership. And for this, uh, we have Ms. Kamini Guleria. She is the leader of Managed Security Services at Midcat uh, Advisory. She is an ex-Naval officer with over eight years of total work experience in various functions of military operations, corporate security and safety, training, human resource management, administration, strategic planning, and business continuity. On the corporate front, she has worked with IBM and is currently heading the entire function of Managed Security Services at Midcat Advisory. So with this, Kamini, I now hand over to you and uh, please take it forward. Um, thank you, Shreya, for the introduction. A very warm good afternoon to everyone who has joined us today. Uh, feeling hugely privileged to be invited to moderate the star-studded panel. And our panel discussion for Visor 2023 is Women in Security Leadership. Uh, now I'll be introducing our panelists, and when doing so, I would request each of our panelists to wave their hands or say hello to our uh, audience. So starting with our first panelist, uh, not in any particular order, Sahima Datta. Currently based in Netherlands, Sahima leads the global security programs, including the deployment of enterprise security solutions across all sites and geographies in Shell, a leading global energy company. In her 30-year security career, she has served the government of India by working in the world's largest and only paramilitary industrial security solutions provider, the CISF. In the corporate sector, she has predominantly worked in managing regional security operations in South Asia, designing enterprise security solutions, etc. Welcome, Sahima, to our panel. Thank you, Kamini. I'm so glad to be here, though it was a little early for me and I had to walk at zero degrees to office, but I'm really, really glad to be here. This is my first panel after I shipped in India, after I shipped it to Hague, and thank you for inviting me. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Sahima. Um, our next panelist is Major Shipra Mishra. Uh, Shipra is an ex-Army officer, brings with her 17 plus years of experience, including her corporate career. In her military career, she has held coveted appointments and has also received commendation card for her meritorious service. Her corporate journey ranges from leading security and administration vertical in BK Birla College, site security and administration lead of large auto manufacturing setup of Tata Cummins, and is currently leading regional security for South Asia and MasterCard. 
She is a certified protection professional CPP from ACES. Welcome, Major Shipra, to our panel. Thanks, Kamini. That was a great introduction. Thanks so much. Thanks, Mitkat. Thank you. Moving on to our next panelist is Pranoti. Pranoti is a seasoned professional with spectacular career of over 15 years in the corporate industry. Based out of Switzerland, Pranoti currently is the head of global security programs at Phillips Morris International. She has held security and intelligence roles at a number of multinational companies across multiple continents. A singular focus through her security career has been to embed security risk management as a core security practice using sustained thinking. She strives for more inclusivity in security, fundamentally empathetic communication, and an entrepreneurial spirit in each security manager. Welcome, Pranoti. Thanks so much, Kamini, and thank you to the team at Midcat for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with this panel. Thank you. Uh, our next panelist is Sanjoli Bhatt. Sanjoli is a corporate security expert with over seven years of experience in the security domain. Currently, she is the head of corporate security for Syngenta, Asia Pacific region, leading a team of experienced security professional, intel analysts with mission of protecting the organization and customers against criminal activities. Welcome, Sanjoli. Thank you, Kamini. I'm glad to be a part of this panel. So looking forward to a great discussion. Hi, everyone. Great. Our next panelist is Vagisha. Vagisha is a risk management expert in various fields of business, politics, and macroeconomics. Currently, she is heading the corporate security and incident management Asia Pacific at LinkedIn. Prior to LinkedIn, she has also worked with Benketon, BBC Monitoring, and TSA Economics. Welcome, Vagisha. Thank you, Kamini. And uh, hello, everyone. Really excited for today's panel and looking forward to learning and um, having an insightful discussion with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vagisha. At last, but not the least, our sixth panelist is Malcolm Smith, an enterprise first thinker and collaborative talent developer. Malcolm Smith has a rich experience of over two decades as a security risk professional and a talent development practitioner. Based in Qatar, he currently is the head of security risk management and electronic security support at QMA. He has a wide experience across several business functions, including supply chain, marketing, finance, HR operations, IT produ uh, production, and procurement. Welcome, Malcolm. Thank you for that introduction, uh, Kamini, and uh, good morning, everyone. And you know what? The two Malcolms are very privileged, yes. you know, to share the floor with all uh, the women in the house. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, special thanks to Pranoti and Sahima for kindly consenting to join in early in the morning from Switzerland and Netherlands, respectively. Malcolm, your perspectives would be hugely valuable as the only one truly adding diversity to this panel. Shipra, Sinjoli, and Vajisha, uh, wonderful to have you in this panel and look forward to learning from you. And now uh, I would request each of my panelists to share their views very briefly on our theme, which is women in security leadership. So not in particular order, I would like to start with Trinoti. Thanks for that. I love how you're going to keep everybody on their toes just now. Uh, look, uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting me again. Uh, I think from my perspective, I'm uh, a little bit sorry that we're still having this conversation in 2023, right? I first started uh, in the private sector in corporate security in 2008, and we're now in 2023, and I feel like we're still having the same conversation. I think the percentage of women uh, in private sector security has gone from being in uh, decimal point digits to being a uh, single digit. Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen uh, you know, that representation occur uh, at the leadership level in security, right? And I think this is one of the reasons that uh, I'm super glad that we're actually having this conversation. And I'm also glad to be joined today by uh, other leaders, other women leaders in security. I think one of my key messages today uh, that I will also touch on in, in different ways is actually, uh, you know, a lot of people ask me what needs to happen, what needs to happen differently. Uh, my position on this has been uh, that people just need to get out of women's careers, you know, just get out of the way. 
and we will do what is necessary uh, to be done. I think allowing people to take charge of their careers uh, is is uh, is a great first step uh, in terms of what uh, needs to change and what needs to happen. I would like uh, for the opportunity, and I would have liked for the opportunity to not be stereotyped uh, as a woman who would be great at desk jobs, great at non-operational roles, great at intelligence, great at a lot of things, right? But great at a lot of things that were predefined by other people for me. Um, and, you know, I was asked to channel my natural abilities with empathy, uh, you know, with uh, all of the all of the normal attributes that people at attach with women. Uh, and frankly, I mean, I'm not sure that I want to be identified with those attributes. I want to be identified with the attributes that I have chosen for myself and the leadership style and the values that I have chosen for myself. Right. Not to say that those are not important. It's just that I may not identify with them. So really, my message today uh, consistently is going to be, uh, you know, what really needs to change and needs to happen for women to succeed in their careers in security, in leadership and elsewhere is for people to be uh, given the space to determine and define their own careers. It is something that we do a slightly better job of offering up to men. Uh, they have their own stereotypes, but I think for women in particular, uh, there are some very uh, characteristic notions that people have and expect. Uh, and uh, I'm very uh, uh, happy to actually have burst a lot of bubbles very early on in my career and continuing to do so in terms of what to expect uh, when people meet me as, as a female leader in security. So. I will pause there and actually hand over to my other panelists. Thank you so much, Pranoti. Uh, Major Shapra, your views, please. Yeah, Kami, um, I've been in the military for uh, 12 years and then stepped into the corporate. So over the years, what I have realized is uh, security is a constantly evolving field, you know, with new technology, different challenges, driving strategies, tech tools, supporting business objectives, and to excel a security professional constantly needs to stay updated, upskilled, requires a resilient mindset, have the industry knowledge, be vigilant and maintain trusted partnerships. And one of the important attributes which I feel is to remain calm and composed. You know, then only you can handle any crisis situation or any uh, exigency per se. And women, in my opinion, and I firmly believe this, I've been seeing my mother, uh, she was a school uh, college principal, that they are excellent leaders and to rise in any leadership position naturally means she must have broken the mental and the environmental barriers, defied her own boundaries, overcome challenges, made meaningful impact and definitely created an acceptance for herself. And all this is over and above her personal obligations towards her children, towards her family. And with a position of power uh, comes immense responsibility, uh, a responsibility to make a difference, not just to the organization, not just to the immediate team, but also for the other women who are capable and can do wonders if they are given the right opportunity. So we do have very, very dynamic women leaders uh, leading security vertical in top-notch uh, countries, in companies, everywhere. And they're definitely setting an uh, example for everyone to follow. I think uh, not just others, I think all of us are uh, making that difference to the society at large. So thank you. Thanks, Kamini. Thank you, Major Shapra, for your views. Um, Sahima Datta. Ma Ma uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I was I was on mute, sorry. Uh, so thank you, Kamini. Um, it's been 30 years since I started this career, first 20 years in uniform, more than 30 years, and next, till next 13 years in the corporate sector. And one line always sums up what, how, what women go through. I've actually literally seen the evolution of a women's journey in this entire sector. In India, of course, I've just stepped out of India uh, eight months back. But in India, I've actually seen from one... Um, uh, hero we had Kiran Bedi to so many today okay so we've seen this journey but one question every time I meet a stranger and that person will ask me what do you do so I would say I work in security and it is wow security how do you deal with the negativity how do you deal and I am like what are you asking me would you ask the same question to a woman working in HR have, haven't we, she and me navigated the same challenges, the same misconception, the same biases and come through this? 
it is a profession. And so three things I think are very important to push women into leadership positions in security is to remove the perception that security is not an industry, but it is a profession, number one. Number two, it is not associated with harassment and violence. It is not associated with negativity. Every time, and then also compartmentalizing women. Oh, women are empathetic, women are patient, women are this, so they're not fit for a security job. Who said that? If anybody knows me and my husband, I am the impatient one, I am the short-tempered one, he's the cool one, he is the patient one. So there are no stereotypes. That's what I'm trying to say. Don't stereotype us and say that, oh, if only if you have, I have seen JDs, which actually says assertive, drive driven, dominated in security industries, you know? Uh, why do we have words which lean on the masculine? I'm not advocating that we have words in a JD which lean on the feminine too, uh, like compassionate and dependable and consideration. These are stereotypes. These are socializations. These are things that we've imbibed as growing up, you know? So let's have a JD which says skills. These are the skills you need. Like any other uh, job, you need risk management skills, strategic risk management skills, you need planning skills, you need uh, stakeholder management skills, relation building skills, you need communication skills. This is what it is all about. It is not about being women stereotyped into certain jobs, women stereotyped into men stereotyped into certain categories. And yes, security is a masculine job. So the first thing that we as women and men in the security industry really need to do is change this perception, change this perception of women not suited for the security industry. Even this little backdrop that I have, the women at background shows a very considerate, patient, mild, soft women. Why are we again falling into the stereotype? Be, it's strength everywhere. Women is strong at home, women, everybody, man or women can be strong, can be weak. Men or women can be patient, can be impatient. So let's not stereotype. Let's focus on skills. And if you focus on skills, I am sure all the girls in this world will be leaders in security, can be leaders in security. It is skills and skills that matter. Thank you. Thank you, Saima, ma'am. Uh, wonderful views and rightly said that we have to change the narrative that goes around with the gender. Um, moving on, uh, Malcolm, your views. So thank you. So I'll, I'll uh, you know, catch up what Shaima just mentioned uh, uh, to tell about, yes, we have to recognize there's difference in anatomy, right, uh, between male and female. And yes, that generally uh, male are um, tooting between uh, inverted commas are stronger, right? There's, there's the thought, that's uh, the stereotype thinking. But you know what one lady has has just made a difference and killed the stereotype. The first lady ever in the toughest security fraternity, which you call in South Africa, the uh, Special Forces Task Force. They are Special Forces uh, uh, Police Force, a rigorous uh, uh, selection process of two years. And she made it without any, without any, you know, downgrading of the standards. She did the, let's call it 100 uh, and whatever push-ups and she stayed with how many days without food and, and in your brand and she shoot as straight as the others could shoot. And she's made it because she has, you know, the, 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 the will and, and the determination to, to achieve. And she's the only one in the history of that organization after the, you know, how many years uh, that the organization exists. So, so, so we can't cut that. However, the, the security industry is still dominated by men. We know that. Right, and, 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 but there are slow progress. If I just look at ASIS, uh, we have had six precedents in, in, in our history, 75 years, 67 uh, years of history, right? Going for the 68 years, it's still too, many, too low, right? Over that many years, only six times, we can increase that because lead or leadership or leading is a verb, right? 
you know, it's all hard work and anyone can do, anyone can lead. It's not about your position or your status in the community. You can lead. I have the problem and I'm trying to, to fix that at home. My wife say, Malcolm, you are the head of the family. You must lead us into blah, blah, blah. And I said, no, why don't you lead us? Right. So I changed the narrative right there at home. My daughter knows when we go on vacation or something, I said, you lead this vacation, you take charge. I'm just on the ride. I'm just having so we, we can change it right there in, in you know the social context in the home setting. So lead, leading, leadership is a verb. Anyone can do it. And women are so better at it in many occasions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Malcolm, for your wonderful views. Uh, Vagisha? Yeah, uh, Kamini, I'm resonating so much with this uh, panel. Uh, you know, all the all the points that everyone's uh, putting forward. It's so, so exciting to see that we are all thinking quite in a very aligned manner. And uh, for myself, since the time I took this position and even till present now, um, as Malcolm was saying that, there is a slow and steady progress. Um, you know, I am witnessing that many companies are attempting to bridge that yawning gap that has been inherently there. Uh, you know, and this male to female ratio and leadership position uh, is not just uh, limited to our security industry. I see the same in other lines of businesses and business functions and in the boardroom as well. So, you know, inclusion and recognition of that, like women leaders across business functions, I think. Um, companies are making that effort to move beyond filling the diversity quota and, you know, just as uh, Pranothi was saying, nice to have sort of rationale. So um, I remember that when um, one of my previous managers, when I took this position, um, they mentioned that, um, you know, Vagisha, um, you, and it had just been two, two days or three days since I joined, and they said that, um, Vagisha, you seem to be very gentle and soft in your approach. You know, you've got to have an air of arrogance uh, to be authoritative, uh, you know, in implementing strategies and driving the operations and such and such. And that initially had confused me, like, is like being compassionate and authoritative, are they mutually exclusive? And certainly it isn't because I figured out my own path, how I want to lead my team, what kind of example I want to set. And um, for me, what is authentic at work? Uh, that matters more than what the expectations and the judgments that is preconceived, not just within security industry, but also with our uh, you know, cross-functional partners and stakeholders. Um, I also had to break this barrier of not coming from a military or a law enforcement background. Uh, and a uh, lot of times, you know, it's, our security industry is also a uh, dominant um, of the skills coming from the uh, military or law enforcement background and such. So me coming from a very risk management oriented perspective, uh, I had to navigate through that challenge as well that, um, as Malcolm said, it's not about um, where you're coming from, what your background is. It's like leading your team, providing the strategic um, you know, direction, anyone can do that. If you have the right skill set available um, and the right uh, approach towards your industry. So um, I'll, um, I'm very optimistic about the, you know, present and the near future. And um, I'm hoping that um, we can um, move forward in the right direction with having more of these kind of conversations, you know, having and telling people that it's okay to be vulnerable um, in these kind of right. platforms. Um, yeah, thanks. Back to you, um, Kamini. Thank you, Vagisha. I think great insights. Uh, uh, moving on to Sanjoli, your quick views. Sure, thank you. I think it's so heartwarming to hear everyone with, you know, you see similar mindset and um, problems, if, you, if I put a challenge. So if I draw from my experiences of being in the security industry specifically from seven years, it's funny and ironic because so many times I have been referred as Mr. Sanjoli, but uh, because of the perceptions of the biases that 
security is a man's job. You cannot imagine a woman doing it. And building on what Vagisha said, I'm not a person from a law enforcement background. I'm not a legal uh, person with a background. I'm a sales and marketing professional from education, from my previous experience. So I bring in soft skills. I bring in stakeholder management, which at, at times doesn't fit in the typical security view that we have of, you know, while it is an important part, but guards and guns. So you speak to any stakeholder or businesses or people outside of your network, you're like, security, what do you do? Do you manage guards? Do you manage stuff like that? No, there are things beyond that. There are things that, you know, include risk management, that include communication. That is that is something that everybody can do who's proficient enough. So I think an underlying theme that comes in very much from hearing all the, you know, panelists is uh, come as you are. You know, someone is assertive, someone is empathetic, someone is soft and political, but is able to get the job, job done in the right way. As I think that's what makes a difference. And that is what is very important for us to be uh, at the forefront as women in this industry, which is still underrepresented at various levels, as statistics say. So for me, it is more about taking chances. And when I see this whole power packed panel in front of me, I am so reassured that I'm, I haven't, because all this while I was like, am I the only one in this uh, job? Have I, like, have I taken the right way? But I see all these experienced women, our experienced leaders, and it reassures me to believe that we are on the right track. People have taken chances to push someone based on their competencies. Women have taken chances to go beyond traditional roles, beyond the boxes that could have been defined for them. So I think that's that's what brings a difference and uh, yeah, I, mean, I think it's it's one of the, these sessions and more so where we could bring in these topics talk about it more take the right steps what building onto what Pranoti said I just love the fact that you know we're still talking about it it's the INE she started yes. in 2008 and we're still talking about it I am uh, I am so it's a sort of a wishful thinking for me that I would be a part of a panel which is the right balance of men and women professionals based on their uh, skills, based on their experiences, based on their competence, irrespective of the gender. I think that's where we need to head to, to bring in the, you know, the diversity and the right balance in the industry, not only security, but from everywhere else, I suppose. I think that's where uh, the whole discussion would be taken. And I'm so excited to hear more and contribute. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sanjoli. Wonderful views. So quickly moving on, to begin our panel discussion, and I would be asking a few questions based on our theme to each of our panelists and would randomly assign it to people. Uh, again, so that uh, Sanjoli, I think you went last, so I would want you to go first now. How do you see the current state of gender diversity in the corporate security industry? And in your views, what steps can be taken uh, to improve it? Uh, thanks, coming again. I think uh, what I shared from my experience being Mr. Sanjoli, but in very uh, in many instances, I think that's first thing that I would want to break biases and perceptions, and that comes in from having conversations, bringing the right level of awareness among the business stakeholders to accept or to give uh, you know opportunities to women based on their competencies just go beyond the gender perception that women cannot do it that you know it's uh, it's only about handling guns and guards and not using your brains security needs that security is all about that managing the risk uh, using resilience and all, all all the qualities that the professionals come through i think one of the basic elements that i have experienced in uh, you know these years i recruit several pre people across apac and when i whenever i try to do so hardly i have come across women uh, job profiles i haven't seen many girls applying for these posts so first and foremost things is for us, uh, for the leaders, for the industry to take initiatives to bringing the awareness at an institutional level that there are opportunities that, you know, women could pursue beyond the typical roles that we, they, are, they are, you know, associated with. Having the awareness again, as I said, businesses for uh, the people 
to be chosen based on competencies, creating opportunities. While we are striving for you know, a right balance, the first and foremost important step is having more and more women come into these roles. So bring in that kind of courage among the businesses to take these chances. I've had that in my role. Uh, to be very honest, being a sales and marketing profession, I jumped into this industry. I joined at a very uh you know administrative role i joined as a coordinator for uh, you know looking after the anti illicit trade program but steadily being in the organization being the culture that we have i was pushed through given the right set of opportunities to make myself available for different platforms to showcase the skill sets that i have managed the challenges there and these you know perceptions are always there within the organization also but then you have allies that help you navigate through so creating these allies that could help you influence give you the right feedback i think those, those are some of the, some of the very important things uh, some a very uh, uh, an element that is very close to my heart is i think as parents when we talk to our kids uh, you know especially girls if your little daughter says you know i want to be a detective don't kill that dream say don't say you know baby a woman is not a girl is not a detective can be a doctor you can be whatever you want build that mindset build that environment in your home right from there that's how it starts you know, i love what malcolm said about you lead it irrespective what right. it, it's not malcolm's job it's his could be his wife's job could be daughter so it's just it's the way that you structure the environment around in your uh in your home and in right your, that you operate. Right. Lastly, right, right. Just last bit is basically mentoring is what came through the entire panel. Then let's bring in the right, right level of mentorship programs. We can do it for our fellow colleagues. We can, we can do it for the people who would want to strive in this industry. I think that would bring the right balance and hopefully more panels where we have equal men and women talking about this uh, great profession right. that we are in. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your honest take on this crucial subject, Sanjuli. I will quickly move on to our next panelist. Malcolm, uh, do you believe it is time that we strongly discuss and do something about this issue of gender imbalance, not merely to achieve gender equity or diversity, but promising results uh, or growth in corporate sector? Uh, second part would be what steps can be taken by the corporations to address the same? Definitely, we, we, we have to move the needle. Now, yes. when we talk about corporate, right, I see people in there and it can be leaders, male and female, because right now we see there are females uh, sitting at the top shed uh, as well as men and who drives policy. And, and that's why corporates start with driving a policy of this change, right, to bring change and focus specifically working in partnership with your recruit, uh, uh, HR and recruitment to say, how do we focus on our, on our diversity uh, agenda, uh, you know, to recruit the right ways? And I think one, many of the panelists has now said, focus on skills. So why would the job description still say uh, uh, ex-military, ex-this, ex-police and so forth? No, 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 no. You want skills. Let's say, for example, investigative skills. It can come from a journalist, it can come from whoever, it comes from a master uh, degrees uh, student, a scientist do research, that's investigative work. So, so it can be anyone that can be your investigator in the team, it not necessarily being a former detective who did criminal investigations, but here we do all type of investigations. Uh, so so let's, let's focus on, on our recruitment process. The other thing we've seen is uh, equity in, in, in benefits, pay promotions. Now, organizations need to look at this. Now, why would a particular uh, uh, job, same as the male counterpart, earns less than, 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 than the female counterpart? Corporates can do better in, 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 in that. Now, yes, there are still studies that say women are a little bit reluctant to negotiate you know, the higher score. But why should she even uh, have to, uh, you know, but the highest, uh, but when the salary range is already set, she has the skills and competencies and so forth, give that <laughs> maximum or 75 uh, percentile. Why only for men and not, uh, not for women? So be, and promotions too. 
why would you know in in, in the corporate uh, you know security specifically uh, the VPs are, are the, the male of, of, of C, CSO CSO is not to be a male I remember last year I actually challenged uh, one of the CSOs I said this role as you are now driving your women in security program hopefully in the next five years or so there will be a, a lady sitting in a role and he looked at me a lot or and say <laughs> not ever I could see I could really sense that he actually say not ever but he's driving it so it's lip service you, you get it kind of Corporate shouldn't, or the people in that position shouldn't sell lip service when we want to make uh, you know positive change. Employee benefits. We've right. seen that, that there's opportunity really to give everyone a fair share and create an inclusive program. It's all about inclusiveness, giving a voice, Absolutely. you know, to to the members on the team. So uh, there's a lot more that, that, but it must be credible. It all must right, be right. credible to drive these kind of change. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much, Malcolm, for your valuable insight. Quite impressive. Uh, so my next question would be to Saima, ma'am. Ma'am, can you discuss some of the barriers that prevent women from pursuing careers in security and safety and what can be done to break down those barriers? And the second part would be, what advice would you like to give to young women who are interested in pursuing a career in security and safety uh, field? Kamini, let me first um, say that I don't like to use the word barriers, okay? Let's say there are challenges. When you talk about barriers, it looks insurmountable. It looks as if you can't break that, you know? So when you say challenges, they look like opportunities. Because every challenge is an opportunity. Every challenge is an opportunity to take some risk. And in any career, like any other career, risk-taking is important in a career like security. Everybody has to take risk to reach to the top. Everybody has to take a gamble to reach to the top. So when I look at my career and when I see the challenges, the first challenge is, as I said before, the visual of security. It's masculine, it's a man's job. It's, and as Vagisha and Sanjoli said, it's connected to people in uniform. I'm lucky I was in uniform, but there are hundreds of women who are not in uniform who want to be part of this profession. Right. So my first challenge is that we have to change this and we have to make every so I will I will uh, give my answer in together with my advice. OK, so to all the girls out there, break security into different parts. There is investigations, there is due diligence, there is fraud, there is insider threat, there is the God's gun part of it also. Then there is technology. Then there is Intel, there is strategy, risk management, there is crisis management. There's so many fields, break it down and see what suits you, what suits your own temperament, okay? And one important thing is that when you see a security CV, you see this as a challenge. And this was told to me by my line manager uh, some years back, who was an Australian. He, I, I, he showed me a CV and said, Sahima, would you like to climb up the ladder and do this when I was the CSO India? And I said, no. Nope. I, I don't think so. I, 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 it's just 50% of this job, you know, this description which suits me. He said, think like a man, a man, even 40%, he will say, I will do it. He will overcome the challenges of the rest 60%. And he said, as a woman, you look for an 80% fit. What I'm telling you out there, girls, these are challenges. Break it down into different professions. Sit, see what suits your temperament, uh, te your temperament and choose the right profession. The second is as leaders in corporate, as leaders in security, all of us sitting here, our job is to see that the challenge when we take out an advertisement, okay? Uh, the visual is always a, a man, a guard, a man, guns, you know? So change this, it, it's the question, you know, Batman versus Catwoman. Let's have a Catwoman as a visual, you know? Why, why a Batman, okay? And also the, please remove the experience in a JD from military and uniform. That is my, all JDs should, JDs, all job descriptions should remove this. It should only list competencies and skills needed for that particular job. If it is actually needed, if you're in executive protection, yes, you need some kind of military background, but there are things in security where you don't need a military background. So why do you write 10 years experience in military or police? Just remove that. The third and most important thing is retention. So a lot of women join the security industries, but fall out. 
they go away. So one size fits all approach to retention is not the right approach to retain women in security. You have to help the women to upskill herself in security, develop skills which will help her reach the top. Uh, Malcolm, your CPP is a great way to upskill. Sponsor women to take this CPP. Sponsor women to go to University of Birmingham to do a, 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 a one-year degree in criminology. So upskill them to reach to the top and build duty of care support systems around the reasons why women want to leave in between build that have schemes like comeback schemes if you want to leave for one year we'll have a comeback scheme so build these things into it and to all the girls out there i i tell you these challenges are not insurmountable they are only opportunities and in my 33 years all i can say is i've loved being in this profession i've really loved it okay and it's nothing to do with who am I? It is a job. And if you do a job well done, there are challenges. I really loved it. So welcome to this profession. And to the question of mentorship by um, Sanjoli. Yes, I've told this before in panels. I am open to mentorship. Anybody can reach me. Whoever is in this panel, reach out to me. I'm there in LinkedIn and I will do the mentorship for you because I am in a privileged position today and I can do it. And I offer my services. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the informative take on it. Um, moving quickly to our next panelist, uh, Megha Shipra. Can you share your experience and insights on the challenges that today's women face in the leadership position in security function? And also, a uh, second part would be, would you agree or not that a significant amount of resistance in accepting women for these position comes from other women itself? So, uh, no, that's it. Uh, Kamini, that's, uh, that's the second part is very interesting. Let me address the first part. Uh, so since uh, uh, a number of panelists have mentioned it already, that security function is considered as a male dominant world. And it is initially challenging for a woman leader to make a presence felt. And I would say, especially amongst the blue collared, uh, some of them oh. have uh, never had an exposure of working in a team which is led by a woman leader. And they do have initial hesitation and lack of trust in her confidence, in her capabilities and all. There is resistance from there in the beginning. However, uh, my experience says that this challenge dilutes uh, with the flow of time once you start working together as a team. And the approach which I personally took, uh, which came in handy to me, and I consciously used to address this was uh, like a uh, few factors such as adequate and timely communication, you no know, setting the right expectations, being approachable, uh, standing with them during their hour of need, building rapport with them, you know, getting to know more of them, listening to the team, everyone, each individual, uh, understanding their perspective. That's very important. And uh, ensuring their emotional safety. And now I feel this part is again very vital because they should not feel threatened around you. They should feel comfortable. And uh, once a certain positive uh, dynamic is achieved, uh, there is no looking back. They just blindly follow you. Now, coming to your second question, I don't think that there is any insecurity per se. I've never had any personal experience from the other women. But yes, I do remember uh, Indra Nui mentioning it uh, uh, as an immigrant uh, and being the CEO of uh, one of the biggest uh, companies, PepsiCo of US. She said that the way men support each other, I think women do not sometime. I think it doesn't strike it. Or uh, like in case if uh, a man is giving a presentation and he's doing a blunder and thereafter they go to the restroom, he will just say, come on, Mike, what are you are doing? You just change that. With women, uh, whether they are hesitant to give that feedback or whether they feel that the feedback given will be taken in a very sensitive way, uh, the other person should not feel offended. I mean, that is the thing. And I also see that sometimes when the feedback is not very candid, uh, it's not constructive, it doesn't give that impact then. So personally, I've never experienced another woman, but definitely I would like to make a change where uh, we welcome more women. And uh, as one of the panelists also said that we should have a support system, uh, being in touch with other women, professionals and all. So I hope that answers your question, Kamini. Very rightly said, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for your valuable inputs. Really appreciate it.
Uh, moving on to our next panelist, uh, Pranoti. So uh, what kind of ecosystem you believe is crucial in promoting gender equity and or, or empowering women in the security leadership role? Second part would be any examples if you would like to share in line with your personal experience in the industry. Sure. Thanks so much, Kamini. Look, I think a lot of very important points have been touched on. You know, we've heard about mentorship. We've heard about equal pay, um, you know, and I think uh, job descriptions, right? Uh, job descriptions that are agnostic of specific role types prior to a specific prior experience. I think one of uh, the things that I've uh, noted is that, yes, there's a lot of mentorship. You know, I think people are very uh, interested in being benevolent and sharing, you know, their experience and, you know, a lot of male allies, particularly, and I say this in air quotes in particular, is because people want to be identified as a male ally. Uh, it's good for the brand, right? It's it's good for the personal brand and they want to be identified as a male ally. So they want to be seen as mentoring uh, younger women in the workforce, right? But it doesn't translate into sponsorship because the reality, if you work in a corporate environment, is that you're going to be put through a calibrations process along with your peers at the end of the year. And you're not going to be present in that room, right? Perhaps your sponsor might be present if you have a sponsor, but if you have a sponsor, and I think this is the difference between a mentor and a sponsor, somebody who opens doors for you in rooms where you're not uh, present yourself to open doors. And I think Sanjoli spoke to her early experience in making that transition and somebody who actually sponsored her um, into more senior roles, into incrementally senior roles in her career, right? And I think this is super important and super critical. Uh, you know, if I speak for myself, uh, I think the only role that I actually applied for was the very first job that I had in corporate security, right? Uh, since then, I've never applied for a job. And, and, you know, I've been here for 15 years and people have hired me for what it is that I can bring. Uh, but more importantly, also people have sponsored me, both men and women have sponsored me into incrementally, uh, you know, significant roles over time across a number of different geographies. And I think this sponsorship is critical. Uh, because, you know, what uh, differentiates often the old boys club from the uh, and precludes women from being in them is the fact that they lack sponsorship. Women lack sponsorship uh, as they get to incrementally senior roles. And I think the second thing is a culture of speaking up, right? What happens very often, and I've noted this certainly myself, is a lot of women tend to remain at the junior levels of the organization because they're good at staff work, right? They're good. And anybody who comes from an armed forces background will be familiar they're good at staff work and that's kind of what uh, is perpetuated also in the private sector because a lot of senior leaders, uh, male senior leaders come from uh, the armed forces background. And so women are uh, sort of shepherded along those careers, you know, without maybe even having an understanding of uh, exposure to, to other areas in security. And, uh, you know, so they sort of remain at those levels of the organization and they don't have the exposure, they don't have the opportunity uh, to gain experience, to gain hands-on experience, because you cannot be a leader if you do not fail, right? And you have to fail sometimes spectacularly, sometimes visibly, in order to develop the resilience uh, and the ability to identify what your core values are as a leader, right? And I think this is the journey that a lot of women don't have the opportunities to go through. So I think uh, that culture of being able to speak up and say, hey, actually, I would like to have this opportunity is something that is, ex I think, extremely important in my experience to build in your organization um, so that people can come forward and say, uh, this is this is a challenge I'd like to take on, or I'm interested in doing that. I'm going to stop here in the interest of time. Thank you so much for your valuable in, uh, inputs. Really appreciate it. Um, Vagisha, uh, how do you, uh, in your view, I mean, how does an organization ensure, I mean, people have talked about various, uh, you know, uh, uh, things to be changed in the respective organization, but your candid view uh, for how uh, an organization should ensure that female employees are provided with equal opportunities and advancement in all sector uh, you know, of uh, career, not only security or safety, but any sector they take in. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kamini. I, I think uh, uh, my fellow panelists have touched upon actually on all these aspects that you just mentioned, but uh, briefly, um, I'll just share that at the end of the day, you know, talent is talent. And whether, uh, a man is bringing that talent to the table or the woman is bringing talent to the table. It depends on um, what is the requirement or the ask from that job description that is supposed to be delivered. So when um, um, the, the judgments and expectations that 
we have from um, women staff wanting to join a particular part of security industry or any other line of function. It's all about what they're bringing to the table and less about the fact that what gender they're belonging to. Um, the other thing is cultural sensitization, I feel is very critical, both vertically and laterally. So um, when we see that women are going to joining, especially in our security industry, um, right from guarding operations to tier one resource level, uh, when they will be when they join that job what is the level of acceptance that they're going to get from their own peers and colleagues and leadership and stakeholders and partners so creating that environment of inclusivity depends a lot on leaders like us bringing those conversation early on um, within the team and with our cross-functional teams and stakeholders that look it's you want a job delivered this person will deliver that job. This person will give the 100% best. It doesn't matter what um, gender they are belonging to. Uh, we also, um, you know, aside from uh, women coming into this industry, we also look at other um, like transgenders and differently abled people. We're trying to bring them into this workforce as well because um, they are, again, one of the, you know, unfortunately, you know, marginalized section of the society in a, you know, organized working sector. And that's, again, we are, again, um, from a LinkedIn standpoint and from um, my team standpoint, we are making that effort to go that extra mile of ensuring that we have the right kind of working environment, regardless of, um, you know, which gender or what industry they're coming from and what they're bringing to the table. So, I don't know if this answers your question because I know that I don't want to repeat everybody else's points already. Right, right. But this uh, I think very actually... aptly answered, uh, Bhagisha. Uh, I, I think the last point which you mentioned that we should look profession purely based on talent and to be having a gender neutral approach is what uh, everybody should move towards. And because women, as uh, we have a uh, you know sensitive take and uh, everything, so. Uh, instead of understanding our role inward, outward also, if we, you know, more focused towards uh, different gender roles and uh, be more empathetic and be understanding towards it so that, you know, any gender, irrespective of male, female or third gender, everything, I mean, people can coexist, provided with the right talent. Very yeah. well, uh, yeah, yeah. So great. And thank you for your valuable inputs. So we are reaching the end of our panel discussion and I would request each panelist to summarize their key points and give the important message as a closing remark on this topic. Uh, starting with Malcolm. Yes, I'll, Quickly, I'll, hook, yeah. on, I'll hook on to the corporate uh, the direction. So one of the things is hold leaders accountable. Leaders has the responsibility to develop other leaders. So hold them accountable to have a psychological safe place for everyone to be inclusive and add their voice, build an inclusive company culture that really make positive change because at the end of the day, it's about innovation. It's about getting business results. So that will, will help when, when we look at gender equity. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Saima, ma'am. Quick closing remark. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, as Malcolm says, we as leaders, I would say we as all women in security, help each other out, reach out to each other, give your shoulders to each other, support each other, mentor each other, sponsor each other, and together we will rise to the top. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Pranoti? You know, I feel like uh, Sahima and I shared a cup of coffee before we got on this panel, <laughs> because what I was going to say was, I think we need to pay it She'll forward. Say the same thing. Yeah, I was going Perfect. to say that we, we need to pay it forward. Uh, I think we've all uh, learned the hard way, uh, you know, what sort of uh, pitfalls uh, we've navigated through. I think this is our lived experience, right? And I think when you can learn from someone else's lived experience, why bother making the same mistake? So uh, again, you know, I think paying it forward is super, super important uh, at this stage in, in all of our careers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pranoti. Amir Shapra. Okay, so Malala Yusufzai said, there are two powers in the world. One is the sword and the other is the pen. Uh, there is a third power stronger than both, that of women. So for all the incredible women out there, 
uh, I would just uh, give a personal message, be yourself. Do what makes you feel good. Love yourself deeply, truly, immensely, passionately. And one thing which I have started practicing recently is emotional management. Manage your emotions well. Uh, don't get ruled by them and don't get triggered with just anything in the external environment. You know, keep the power within yourself. And uh, last but not the least, feel powerful, feel powerful. And the world is yours. So thanks. Thank Kamala. you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Major Shipra. Vagisha? I would actually um, do a, a plus plus one to Shipra about the uh, feeling of, you know, self-empowerment. Coming from that place is super important for us women, especially because um, as uh, I think one of our panel was talking about, um, we don't apply to certain jobs just because, you know, it's not matching our a certain threshold of job description. Uh, to be really honest, when I applied for this position, I thought that I don't even um, match 30% of it, but I was like, what the heck, I want to apply because I find it exciting. So find your excitement, what, what brings your original passionate self to work, what brings your authenticity, um, and that's what's going to shine at the end of the day. And that's what's going to bring it and help other women join this uh, not just security industry, any line of function. Any, nature, any line of yeah. function. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Vagisha. Sanjali? Think very quickly, I would actually uh, summarize with the quote from Sheryl Sandberg that I really love. It's very close to my heart. Uh, to all the girls, to all the women uh, trying to strive in the industry or anywhere else, when you're asked to get on a rocket ship, do not ask which seat it is. Just get on it. To get on the ship, take off and you know move ahead the best way you can and to the uh, to the uh, you know leaders the business and to the external stakeholders allies in there take a chance take a chance on everyone like Mary said in earlier but know you can't fight with one arm you know you need two arms make us the other arm bring, bring in the right balance and I'm so so glad to be here and uh, hearing everyone thank you again uh, thanks to Midcat. thank you so much Sanjoli thank you panelists for your candid views, your knowledge, expertise, and sharing your personal experience and opinions on this crucial topic. Indeed, a lot of takeaways and learnings for me and for the audience out there. Looking forward to stay in touch with you all for any future uh, collaboration. Thank you. Shreya, over to you. Amini, and uh, I, I, I do uh, apologize for my uh, intimidating uh, MC move of switching on my camera, but time management is key. And I really want to thank everyone. And I'm really enjoying the chats on the side. And I hope everyone's having a good chuckle out of it too. Uh, thanks, Vagisha and Pranati, for, and uh, to all our panelists for uh, bringing so much energy and saying it like it is. I think that's the new way to go about it. Thanks, Kamini. That was excellent uh, moderation from you. Um, and uh, now not wasting any more time, I would just like to uh, invite um, Colonel Sushil Pradhan, our executive, <coughs> sorry, our executive director and chief operating officer at Midcat Advisory to uh, deliver the closing remarks uh, for Wiser. Thank so, you. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Shreya. And thank you, everyone. It was such a scintillating and wonderful and uh, humorous discussion at the same time, especially with all the side notes happening. And that was really interesting conversation happening. <clears throat> that just shows that how well uh, each of you are willing to support each other, share with each other and take this forward to the next level of mentorship and sponsorship. So I actually don't have too many closing comments because you guys have said it all, not just you, uh, starting with both the keynote addresses, which were absolutely, absolutely amazing in their own way. Then we had the first panel, which was focused on those who are in the Intel industry. We had the second panel, which was focused on those into resilience. And then we had this third panel with people who are dealing with um, security note that i'm saying people not women okay uh, because uh, i think that has come across very strongly in all the discussions that people uh, want to be recognized on their capability we have to acknowledge the fact that women are equally capable they just need to be provided the opportunity to prove themselves and as some of the panelists have very well said 
that if you don't get the opportunity, create an opportunity or seize the opportunity for yourself. But they definitely need mentorship and sponsorship. Because any organization today realizes that uh, gender diversity brings creativity and widens the perspectives. So again, get there on competence, not on concessions and help out each other. And uh, as a closing note or a closing thought, I have two uh, ideas that came to my mind. Uh, keeping in view this very strong theme of equality and not um, uh, let's say not concession based or uh, gender based forced diversity should we actually be having a wiser event the next year um, because then that's like accepting the fact that you still want to compartmentalize women because they are not yet there so uh, that's food for thought uh, and another thought that came to mind is that Hopefully, five years back, uh, five, uh, okay, five years is too long a time, maybe two years hence, can we be not having such events which are focused on women because women are already a major part or an equal part of the industry, whether it is Intel, Resilience, Security, and EHS. So just two thoughts that I want to leave you all with, and uh, there are no right answers, there are no wrong answers, but... Uh, Thank you all for being here. A huge round of applause to all our speakers on our panelists and not to forget the audience who's been with us for the last three hours plus all along. Thank you so much, guys. Big round of applause. I don't know whether we'll see you each in this event forum next year. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Shreya. All yours. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, like Sir said, thank you uh, to the audience for being so engaged, so participative, and for always, always showing up uh, whenever Midcat uh, makes the effort of bringing together uh, a diverse uh, set of speakers. And uh, before we log off, I'd just like to make an announcement that uh, all the participants will be receiving a certificate uh, later on. And um, Thank you once again for making the time. And you can find um, the recording of this session uh, of uh, Advisor 2023 on YouTube and our LinkedIn and website as well. So in case you'd like to forward or share and um, express, um, share the amazing, amazing insights that we've had today, uh, please uh, do so and it'll be easy. So thank you once again and uh, have a great day ahead. Thank you, Mitkat. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Mitkat. Thank you, Thank you fellow panelists. Thank you, everybody.